the uh, Board of Selectmen's meeting, Monday, June 28th, at the Warcoit meeting room, Mashby Town Hall. I know Excuse me, gentlemen, your mics are on. <laughs> and Mashby Town Hall, 16 Great Neck Road North, Mashby, Mass. Broadcast live on local cable channel 18 and stream live on the town's website, Mashby, Mass, ma.gov slash channel 18. And it is six o'clock, and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'd like to have a moment of silence. This week we've lost two gentlemen from Mashby that have given a lot to this community. And I'd like to have a moment in silence for them. Thank you. We're gonna open up the meeting tonight with the Affordable Housing Trust with an update on the 950 Falmouth Road Affordable Housing Project. I'll ask. So Hi, e Dave. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Dave Quinn from Housing Assistance Corporation, mm -hmm. and I'm here to represent uh, the developer of, of 950 Falmouth Road, Hack and Pollock, Preservation of Affordable Housing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here today to also uh, to re uh, represent the developer on behalf of our request for housing trust funds of $300,000, and also just to give a quick update on the, the status of the project. So I think the last time I was here, the project was, we were kind of just going into finalizing the development agreement for the project, which is 39 units of affordable housing. Since then, over the past year, we have successfully gone through the comprehensive permit process, the 40B comprehensive permit process, and we successfully obtained our comprehensive permit in February, on February 2nd, through yes. unanimous vote of the, the ZBA. So, uh, it was really uh, a testament to the, the work of um, the town uh, and all the support that they gave our, our development team, uh, department heads, uh, and members of the ZBA for their, their work to kind of work with us as the developer to, to, um, to get, get through that permitting process in a really, in a really quick manner. Um, for the most part, the plans remained uh, you know, as we proposed them, other than a few minor changes to, um, to address some of the concerns of abutters. Uh, such as additional buffering, uh, some additional crosswalks and sidewalks and things like that. But for the most part, um, the plans that we had proposed that, um, that you saw probably a year and a half, two years ago now, um, when this was first started, uh, are, are pretty much uh, intact. And uh, now we're entering the next phase in the process, which is the funding process. Uh, so we also did apply to DHCDs uh, for tax credits. Uh, and that we, we actually applied for that uh, just to mm -hmm. get an application in in January before the project was even permitted uh, in the hopes that we could get in in that first round. Unfortunately, we did, did not get funded uh, for tax credits, um, which is the bulk of the funding for this project. Um, but that's somewhat expected. It's very rare for a project to be funded in, in the, the first attempt into, uh, into DHCD. And when will you apply again? Uh, the next, uh, we just got word that the next uh, opportunity is actually coming up in August. Okay. Um, the HCD is hosting a, what they call a mini round for shovel ready, not shovel ready, but ready, ready to go projects, permitted projects. Um, and we feel like we are, we're very competitive in that. So we're gonna be submitting <coughs> a pre-application in August and then a full application in September for that if we we're invited to apply, which we, we expect we will. And a big part of that, um, that application is gonna be showing that we have the local support for the project. Um, it is a requirement to have some type of local funding commitment as well. Um, to, to show that the, the town is, is behind the project, which um, you have been through this whole process. Um, so that's really why I'm here, to, why I'm here today, to, to answer any questions you may have about our request for, for funds for this project. I did provide uh, some, some, um, some material as well, mm -hmm. a copy of the comprehensive permit if you had any questions about anything that happened during the permitting process, a copy of updated plans, and, uh, and then just sort of a, a brief summary of the project as well to give you a sense of the timeline uh, and, and uh, the types of funds we're looking for. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And we're looking at to start maybe construction 
in June of next year? That was ba when I submitted that request. Yeah. That was based mm -hmm. on uh, getting getting the funding funding in, um, in the, the first round. So that's probably pushed back about six months, okay. um, depending on the outcome of uh, of our next application to the state. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Dave, does the uh, <clears throat> does the allocation of the funding request you have for us today help you in your application become more competitive at DHCD for tax it's, credits? It absolutely does. I mean, that's it, it's uh, it's really important for us to have local funds because it helps us leverage. It's one of the things that the state looks at when they're scoring these proposals that come in. The more support, uh, both through the town uh, offering the land and then also additional financial support, really does help us uh, stand out from other projects around the state. Thanks. Yep. So, so then, it, <clears throat> do you think it's just the funding that is slowing this project down for the most part? Yeah, and it, it, I wouldn't even say it's slowing it down. I mean, this is very typical of these tax credit projects. Um, most of the time, it's at least the second application uh, before you get in. Um, so, you know, it was a little bit of a long shot uh, to get it, to get accepted in the first round, but we, you know, we did submit it to, to make sure that we got on the state's radar. And uh, now they're very aware of the project. They've done a first review and encouraged us to to reapply uh, in the fall. So uh, we feel pretty good about it. Um, yeah. But of course, it is a competitive process. Yeah, let me ask you this. How do you think that the delay is going to affect the cost of this project? I mean, I, I'm a contractor. I understand sure. the value of materials and mm -hmm. labor at this time, both are in the shop to supply and more expensive. How do yeah. you think that's going to work in this? I, th I think that is a big question. Obviously, the market for construction is super volatile right now. Um, a part of our reapplication to the state, we're, we're doing an updated construction estimate um, through, through our contractor that's going to do pre-construction estimates for us. So right now, um, uh, we're, we're, trying to, we're analyzing that and trying to figure out exactly how, you know, um, what the recent increases in costs are going to do to us. We're hopeful that things are starting to come back down a little bit. I mean, there's no guarantee. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not seeing anything going down. Yeah. All I'm seeing is going up materials in particular. Right. Right, so that is something that we're, we're continuing yes, to do. I know it's hard to predict, yeah. I know, but I don't, I'm wondering if it's gonna push this project so far out of the realm. I mean, it's just something to be concerned about. I'm sure there's probably more federal and state money available than there was in the past mm -hmm. that'll help to offset that, but. Um, yes, yeah, this, I mean, the state is very aware of, of the, you know, the increasing cost, and so that's something that they are seeing more and more of with requests coming in higher than, you know, they'd seen in the past, and so certainly we're gonna have to size our request to the state based on those those updated numbers right. depending on where they land right i hope that's why you know i think that's why i should say that the, the feds have um, loosened up and given so much money to the state actually the county government has been funded as well so there's money there's a lot of money to be had um, i guess you just have to go out knocking on doors so um yep and, and actually we do we do currently have an application pending before the uh, the barnstable county home consortium as well for some additional funds so yeah um, we're, we're definitely trying to um look at every, you know, every angle um, for funding. And, um, and again, we feel, we feel pretty confident going into this next funding round. Yes, yeah, I'll bring it up. I'm at the, on the assembly of delegates, so I'll, I'll bring it up and, um, and see if there's anything available or what, anything that we can Excellent. do. Thank I you. know the money is there. Okay, Alan. Uh, when do you expect the uh, home consortium to act and are they in any way waiting for action uh, by the town of Ashby uh, before they act? They are not. They're currently doing their, their underwriting of the project and they're, uh, we are working with them to, uh, um, to get them updated construction numbers as well. That's a part of their underwriting process. So uh, we expect we'll have an answer on that um, this summer, um, hopefully before we submit the application, but, um, but it, it is under review right now. Uh, they meet once a month. Would action by the town of Mashby uh, tonight uh, help you in any way on that? I think it may, yeah. Okay. yeah. That would be nice. Patrice, any questions? No. no questions. Uh, just a quick one. Um, so you mentioned right now it's still the plan is 39 units? That's right, yeah. yeah. Is there a fallback plan of like if costs are extraordinary still? I, I, although I do hope that this delay in time time factor may play mm -hmm. into our favor as far as costs maybe starting to, to decrease. Is there like a fallback plan to say either you're going to maybe ask for more money or if the costs don't, you know, subside a little bit, or is there like a fallback plan to maybe decrease the amount of units? No, we, would, we wouldn't decrease the amount of units. Okay. We, you know, we, have a, we have a fully permitted project at 39 units. Uh, it, it wouldn't help us to decrease the units. 
um, in terms of construction costs, just from an you know, economies of scale kind of perspective. I think, you know, it's a little premature to say, you know, exactly what uh, we would do if, you know, if, you know, prices came in way higher than we were expecting, but I think as a team we would, we would regroup and then try to identify additional funding sources, work closely with the state uh, to try to make sure that we're, we're, you know, putting together a project that's, uh, that's financeable. Great answer. Yeah. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Andy, <coughs> Good. Anybody else? So. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank um, you very much. Do we, do we act on the request for the funding? Second, for the funding. Yeah, discussion and approval of the Housing Assistance Corporation request for additional funding for 950. I'd make a motion that we approve the request for $300,000 of funding for the 950 project. I'll second that motion. Do I have a roll call? John? Yes. Andy? Yes. 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 Yes, thank you. Thank you all for your time. Great, thank you. Great presentation. Discussion and approval of pursuing transferring the 108 Commercial Street property <clears throat> from the Town of Mashby to the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, Wayne, do you or well, Alan, do you want to? I think Alan can speak to speak? it. But basically, what okay. we're looking for is for the <clears throat> trust to put a motion on the town meeting warrant to move uh, Mashby owned property 108, I think it's 108, Commercial Street. Uh, to the Affordable Housing Trust to uh, work uh, with the EDIC in creating workforce housing. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if this is uh, needed now, but um, do we need a motion? We need a motion to put it on the warrant. Submit an to submit an article. To, oh, to the town? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, and I'd like to move that we uh, do that. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay. Roll call? Yes. Aye. Yes. David? Yes. 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 We're a step closer. Yep. Thank you. And do we need an action to um, um, go out on an RFP? Um, Not until our next meeting, probably, after we transfer the, the title yeah. from town meeting. Ah, okay. Okay. Nice okay, try. so we will adjoin the joint meeting with the photo. Affordable Housing Trust. So moved. So, second. Roll call. Yes. 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 Tom. Why? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, approve, yeah. approval of the following Monday, June 7th, 2021 regular session. So moved. Second. Roll call? Yes. 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 Okay. 6.40. It's early. No. It's early. No. no. I just skipped that one. Okay. Yep. Public, so I'm going to go down to new business. Public comment. Yeah, public public comment. There was a lot of There's people a lot coming of for 6.30, so it's just to Carol right. to hold it till 6.30. to hold it till 6.30. Okay. Um, well, we do the um, minutes? We just did the minutes. Oh, Transfer station. Okay. Yeah. Annual contracts? Yes. Okay. Discussion and approval award of annual contracts for operation of the transfer station, hauling of recyclables, Department of Public Works, Director Catherine... I haven't named them off yet. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Going out of sequence here. Yeah. Good evening. Um, this is our renewal for the upcoming fiscal year for the operation of the transfer station as well as, as the hauling that's associated with our collection. Okay. Yeah. So is this the last year of the three-year contract authorization? Yes. So what's the plan for next year? We will issue a, a new RFP. Do we st start that middle we, of the we, year? We generally start it around January. Okay. Um, 
as you may recall, last time, I think we had just the one bid yeah. or proposal. Um, but we will try. Can I suggest that we develop a plan B alongside? Because what happens is, you know, you put it out January, we get one bid, it's right up against the end of the year, and we don't have any options. Yeah. And so we're like stuck with, well, we got to take the, the bid because we don't have any options. So right. even if we don't think we're necessarily going to do it, could we develop an option to do it in house so that we at least have some basis upon compare what the external bid would be? We could. I mean, you get one bid, it's a shotgun marriage. So it is what it is, and you don't have any choices. Right. And, you know, we've been sort of, this has worked out a little better for us, given the difficulty we have with the hauler. But given some of those issues, I just think it would be nice to have an option. <clears throat> I don't like being captive. I don't think anybody likes just having one well, option. Right. Can we go out and... and uh, look at what other towns are doing for their? Most towns um, do operate it themselves. Themselves. Right. Mashpee is unique in that we yeah, contract out true. operation. And there right. just are not a lot of, of companies that are interested in, in that type of work. Right. We, we did look at that um, probably six to eight years ago um, mm -hmm. and had different options. Um, the town doing it entirely in-house, the town um, staffing um, but continuing to contract out the hauling and then the the last one which is what we currently do is is contracting out the entire operation right i would agree with andy yeah. i do too i think I it's know, a good just, idea I do. I really something do. that could yeah. be aired too exactly i don't think it hurts yeah. i do too with with the other towns uh is that a full-time position how many staff uh, do we have that kind of information? Um, I certainly can can um, get the comparables. Um, it is multiple staff and equipment. Um, yeah. That's, I think, one of the, the issues that we ran into when we last looked at it is there's a lot of capital if you're doing it entirely in-house right. because while we own the, the property and some of the equipment, we don't own the, the tractor trailers, we don't own the trailers, we right. don't own the, the um, excavator, you know, all of that would be a, a capital outlay if, if we went the 100% in-house. In the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Yes, right. It's I an understand. expensive start. Yeah. And that may not be what we do. Right. right. But I'd like the, I'd like the, I mean, the contractor knows that he's probably not going to get any competition out there. <laughs> so unless we create some competition yeah. and some price pressure and be serious <clears throat> about whether, then he can just charge us whatever he wants, which yeah. is what he does. Right. And, right. yeah, I, I agree. And it, but I also would like to, Instead of like more looking at it, I'm assuming you're going to look at this as like a three or a five year plan so we can, you know, because that initial outlay of costs would be, if you compare it year over year, one year, it, mm -hmm. there's no re that's obviously going to be much more expensive. But if we waited out over a three or five year plan, you know, that would be. <clears throat> well, we can, we can lease the equipment. I mean, we don't have to buy all the equipment. So there's options out there. So, but, mm -hmm. and if we do set up a separate, entity on its own, you know, um, the transfer station set up by its own and hires its own employees um, under, Ma you know, under with the town of Mashby. We don't have to own the employees for life. Um, mm. So the yeah. space that uh, the town is yeah. 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 Kind of well, we, yeah. can't, we can't set it up in a way that we can protect ourselves and just if it doesn't uh, work within so. the first three years, four Once years. we sign those contracts yeah. with the union. It's done. That's where the problem comes in. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. It's an issue. I mean, it's but at least we, you know, we haven't. That's no. Catherine's right. You know, we we chewed this all around for six years ago or so and decided mm -hmm. to stick with what we were doing because the startup costs were unpleasant and the long term employee costs were unpleasant. But you know, I think it's worth revisiting just for the reason I already stated. If, if it's I agree if nobody else is out there, then it's a blank right. check. Right. I, I I think maybe we could start a little earlier. Yeah. We could be a little more aggressive in uh, making sure that anybody that is competent and qualified to bid uh, gets a proposal in, and uh, we can also look at option B, although I would be very surprised if that is a cost savings measure. Mm. It may not be, but if we get better performance out of what we're doing and compliance with our rules and regulations to our employees, heard we are fairly diligent about discipline. 
As far as as far as looking at comparables, um, you know, maybe consideration that uh, that you outsource the actual hauling, uh, you know, uh, contracting with a, a private owner of a tractor as a rig, and you know, just contract for the hauling, so it's not an employee with fringe, and you don't have to deal with the unions on I, that road. Subcontract. I, I like that idea. And then and then look at uh, you know just purchasing the containers. Um, and if there's a, a, a rig on site to kind of shuffle things around, then you know that might be a better approach. Sure. No, and, and that's exactly what we did. We did the, the yeah. three options, and so we'll look at that. There are towns that 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 do that, um, that that own the trailers, but um, uh, contract out the hauling. Yes. I mean, nobody likes to talk about it, but I know. we don't have to run. We could. To say it's private market and you make arrangements for your own municipal, your own pickup. Yeah. We don't have to run a town facility. It's worth looking at too. What's your I'm just saying, you yeah. know, you, there are plenty of communities in which your private waste hauler is the person who comes and picks up the stuff, and the town's not involved at all. It's true. So we could walk away from the whole arrangement. Well, let's see. Another what we option. Let's see what right. comes to the table in December, November or December. So once we get through the, the next budget cycle. Uh, so. We'll know more. Right. I Thank guarantee you. you if you had that conversation about a private waste hall would charge you to come to your house, you'd have a little bit different reaction to your dump sticker fee. <laughs> <laughs> I think we would. Thank you. All right, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, last year of the annual uh, contract for operation of the transfer station, hauling recyclables to gotta do as proposed by the Director of Public Works. I'll second Parks. that motion. Thanks, Andrew. Roll call? Yes. Andrew? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, discussion and approval of a temporary sign permit for the annual Seaside Le Mans, September 4th and through the 11th, 2021. Kelsey Ellis, I um, told staff this morning that they didn't have to have her come in because it's an annual event and it's run very well. And Make a motion we authorize the temporary sign permit. And Seconds. Roll call. Yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. And discussion approval and appointment of the following sewer commission member at large. Term expires June 30th, 2023, Alfred Toll. I also uh, found out that Alfred was going on vacation. So we didn't ask him, to, we wanted to get him on this committee. Um, he's got yeah, very good as, as liaison, I sat in on the sewer commission's interview oh, of him. He's very highly qualified. Yes. He'd be a great asset to the commission. I make a motion we appoint Mr. Tall to the uh, at large position for the sewer commission. I'll second. Roll call. Tom? Yes. David? Yes. 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 Good. Thank you. I will note it's the first time the sewer commission has been fully staffed by up to its limit in a Years. decade, maybe. That's great. Um, and do I have um, under communications and correspondence and old business discussion and approval of liaison assignments. Is everybody okay with their assignments? Yeah. Everybody's yes. okay? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you want to do a discussion and approval to authorize the town manager to execute the required submissions for financial assistance? from the Mass Clean Water Trust. Yeah, so the um, <clears throat> the trust is, the, they're the entity that provides the low and no cost financing to the town's wastewater project. Per the town meeting article, it requires the signature of either board selectman or the town manager, the sewer commission chair has signed off on it, but I'd like to make a motion that uh, the board delegates authority to the town manager to execute uh, required submission for financial assistance to the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust. I'll second that motion. Any uh, discussion? Further? No? Okay. No. Uh, John? Yes. 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 Discussion and approval of a letter opposing the multi purpose machine gun range proposed by the Massachusetts National Guard. 
Oh, I'm sorry. On which one? The, 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 gun, range. the gun range? Okay. You may. <clears throat> do you want to do your time on it? Yeah, would you? Just tell people. We're doing a three minute comment period. We have a lot of comments. We tonight. have a lot of comments tonight. Okay, I'll be quick. Okay. So, um, as you know, my name is Mary Wagan, and I'm a resident of Mashpee, and I'm a new member of the Sierra Club of. Uh, uh, sorry, Sierra Club Cape Cod Group. So I see on your agenda that you'll be discussing the development of a multi-purpose machine gun range on the base on land that has been set aside specifically for drinking water protection and would, you like, and would like to offer these comments on behalf of the Sierra Club. Since the 1990s, Sierra Club has been working with citizens and allies to protect and remediate the Upper Cape's drinking water supplies from the threats posed by contamination resulting from previous military activities at the Massachusetts <coughs> Military <coughs> Reservation, now called Joint Base Cape Cod. Sierra Club is particularly concerned that the proposed machine gun range will threaten the Sagamore lens of the Cape Cod's sole source aquifer, which is our drinking water, with gun range activities and the clearing of 170 acres of land. Um, part of this clearing and maintenance of this clearing would have spot treatment and overspray of herbicide chemicals. Um, I hope that you join the Sierra Club um, in requesting that a full environmental impact statement is completed prior to any approval of a multi-purposed machine gun range at this site. So now my own, I would like to add my own comments in that these soils um, have high infiltration rates, higher than other places in Massachusetts. These soils are basically sand and have little capacity to hold back or filter out pollutants. And that's why we've seen so much pollution from the base getting into our local drinking water. As you know, right now, Mashpee drinking water is contaminated with PFAS from past activity on the base. It was firefighter training. It wasn't a gun range. But the Mashpee Water District had to uh, approve an allocation of $8.5 million for filters for our drinking water. Um, when the federal government was asked to compensate us for that, um, according to the Mashpee Water District, they said no. So I just hope that you um, join the Sierra Club and me and ask, ask demanding for an environmental impact statement um, of the proposed multi-purpose gun range prior to any approval. Thank you. Anybody else have public comment on the <clears throat> gun range? Okay, yeah. okay, if not, um, based on the meeting discussion we had a couple meetings ago, um, I took the liberty of drafting this letter for the board to consider submitting, or uh, actually going a little bit further than what Mary's comments just were, just, just simply to oppose the gun range as is currently um, considered before the Environmental Management Commission um, for a lot of reasons that she mentioned and some others that she didn't. Um, this thing is just a bad idea at this location. They haven't made the case for the need for it or the ability to meet the requirements of the state law that requires um, compatibility between um, training activities and the protection of the water resource. So this letter is very similar, almost identical, to that which was uh, adopted by the Cape and Islands uh, Selectmen and Counselors Association at their meeting two weeks ago. Um, and I would ask the board to consider submitting it. The um, process is currently a little bit of a standstill. Uh, when we originally discussed this, the Environmental Management Commission was scheduled to meet um, on July 12th. That has been postponed um, with no schedule for conducting that meeting um, until uh, the governor's office submits uh, appointment or confirms appointments for a number of representatives to the Citizens Advisory Council that have not been made over the last six years, frankly. Um, but weighing in on this now would be an appropriate action for us to do. Uh, I, I'm, I have a couple questions as far as sure. status, and I don't know who can, if anyone's here that can answer it, but um, is it my understanding that it's on hold at this point anyways? The meeting where they would consider it has been postponed and not rescheduled as of yet. So. So, I, I, again, I, I, I'm battling with, you know, opposing it. I do have a need for some clarification. Um, 
So, and at the same time, I'm wondering, you know, if it's on hold or indefinitely at this point. Um, I don't know what the urgency of the letter would be. Um, that's that's just my opinion. Okay. So I'll, I'll jump in. I re when we had this conversation on regarding reaching out to the, uh, uh, the the base, and it was for more information, and I don't think we've received any more information. I don't know what's true, what isn't true. Um, we've had no communication whatsoever at all. Um, and, that, and I'd like, just like to hold out to find out what is going on. What is their plan? Where is this going? Is it true that this is going to affect our drinking water? Um, it, it's Right now, it's all hearsay to me. I mean, I don't know if, you, if you've received anything from them or had been at another meeting, maybe the selectmen's meeting. Um, uh, you know, I'm not quite certain. I haven't heard anything, Andrew. Well, part of the reason is they've done a particularly terrible job in conveying to the public what it is that they're planning on doing. Um, and the facts, I suppose, depend a little bit on who you ask. Their environmental assessment is a self-certification of their own proposal. They proposed the draft. They assessed the impacts as they understood them. They deemed the 400 public comments that were received to be not relevant. They did not alter one single solitary aspect of this project in response to almost 400 public comments raising concerns. And then they went to the Secretary of the Air Force who certified their own findings as adequate and therefore not needing an environmental impact statement that would subject their assessment to an independent third party review. So. If you want to ask them, they'll tell you it's fine. Um, they have declined to date John's invitation when he was chair, mm -hmm. Carol's subsequent invitation to come in any time this summer to brief this board on the project. Their strategy had been um, to <clears throat> take their self-certification and run as fast and as hard with it to get it approved as quickly as they possibly can. Um, the information that they've provided is out there as a matter of public record. Um, it's there for people to review if they chose to. Ninety Over 90% of the public that commented on it reviewed their information and found objections with their findings. And in terms of, John, your comment about why now, why not now? Um, this is largely a political exercise at this point to have our elected officials who are embodied by their representatives of the governor to the three environmental management commission spots realize that there lacks public support for this project as it's been conceived and publicized. Um, I think that sending the message to the town of Mashby is supportive of protecting its drinking water resources. I do too. Um, at this stage of the process actually will have a greater impact than when they decide to proceed because if enough towns stand up and say, Actually, our residents and our constituents um, are speaking for us and they're reflecting concerns that are legitimate in the community. Maybe the governor's office will think twice about even scheduling this thing for a vote. So I think it's a particularly influential time to weigh in um, and to fight back on the disinformation campaign um, and the blatant uh, disregard for public input that is not a theory, but is a reality based on commanding officer at the base's own commentary and dismissive uh, response in his threatening letter to the Chamber of Commerce that dismissed um, anyone who raised a concern about this as an activist, anti-military, um, or agitator, I think was the term. And maybe the third one I might be wrong about. Um, and it revealed that what a number of us suspected, which is they didn't care what the public said. They didn't respect the public's concerns enough to give it due consideration. And I'm not speculating. I read his letter. But was he the retired general? He's a retired general. He's the retired general. He's the, general. He's but he's, the, he's the executive director of Joint Base Cape Cod. It's his project. He's in charge. He's, he's in, in charge. charge. And I'll be honest with you. Let's cut to the chase. If this is the threat, there's a true threat to the drinking water or anything environmentally, mm -hmm. I said, I'm, I'm not going to vote, uh, vote for this support, or to support this. But I just, I just haven't. I just want to know what they're planning and what the what the threats are, and if there is a threat, and they, then it's not going to happen. Well, it depends on who you ask. They've said no threat, nothing to see here, move along. 
Everybody, almost everybody else who's looked at the thing has raised concerns, and they've said, you're wrong. Right. Now, yeah. you, can, you can choose to believe the military at its word that they're wrong, that we're all wrong, and we're crazy, and we're just imagining that we're still in the middle of a $1.2 billion cleanup of all the poison they put on the land prior. Um, or, and you, and you can take the word of the guy who's running the project who revealed that he didn't give any respect to the public comments and say, and hey, maybe you guys need to go back to the drawing board and start over again. That's the message I want to send them. You know, you can't do it the way you've done it. Right. Um, right. You know, the way it's worked in the past, the last 20 years, has been with transparency and honesty between the Guard Bureau and the surrounding communities. That has resulted in cleanup and the allowance of uh, multiple uh, facilities expansions, thousands of people being trained on the base, but done in a way that is respectful of our water resources. And For whatever this, reason, they decided now is the time to break that pattern. And unless we stand up to them and say no, you have no idea what's coming next. Because if they get away with it this time, they're going to ram whatever the heck they want down your throat the next time. That's right. This, is, this is just a bad idea for the Cape in general. I mean, you know, as a, as a sole sauce aquifer, we're all drinking from the same water. You know, the, this base is, this project's just better suited somewhere off Cape in a remote area away from people, um, especially with the uh, Cape Cod sands being as um, uh, high filtration levels that they have. You know, uh, our rivers that come, come in as mash being quashing it as the most contaminated rivers on Cape Cod and in the region. And, you know, when they were doing the fire suppression foam, uh, you know, nobody was really testing for PFAS. And now here we are with uh, contamination in our rivers. So, I mean, you know, what they're testing for now, what the criteria is, may not um, have all considerations to what may affect us down the road. And, you know, why take a gamble on our drinking water? I, I mean, if everyone has to stop paying for drinking water mm -hmm. and they've made significant strides in cleaning up the Superfund sites with, uh, they're still filtering out water out of the uh, mega, out of the aquifers, you know, through filtration systems at various locations and doing, um, you know, uh, uh, coordinated water quality tests now and still discover plumes of stuff. So, you know, it's a critical environment that we have and share here on Cape Cod and in the region. And I, I just don't understand, you know, like, like Andrew said, um, they haven't stated a need to put it on Cape Cod uh, as of yet. Uh, there's no justification to do it. There's, I, I think, many other better places to do it. And, you know, I'll go on record as saying, you know, I'm not opposed to training. I think that we should uh, support our military and, and, and provide adequate training. But to do this type of exercise and this type of project on Cape Cod, on our military base, in our backyard, where we're a sole sauce aquifer, where high, highly um, uh, uh, the, the sands just filter at such a rapid rate, that it's just a bad idea and it, it's taking too much of a risk. Uh, I'm not willing to put you know, my, my children and grandchildren's drinking water um, at, risk. at risk like that. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. I right. think everybody Carol, can I ask you a question? Um, it's my understanding that the military, the Guard leadership has proposed coming in and giving yes, us an update on activities at the base. Yes, I was, just, I was just going to start. They in said August. that they would come in on August 5th, which is, uh, I'm sorry, Mashby will be August 9th. This is a brief to the town selectmen, which will last about an hour. Any request for briefs specific to the gun range will need to be coordinated and scheduled separately as the brief can take one to two hours alone. So another way to say that is they're willing to come in and talk about anything but the but gun range. The gun range, Correct. exactly. And That's they're going to playing. other towns. They're going to other towns. I don't want to play this game They're anymore. going to Sandwich on July 22nd, Falmouth July 26th, and Barnstable August 5th. So that is, and that's what I was just going to clarify as yeah. far as, um, so we'd have a two-hour meeting with just them talking about the base if they come in. Most abutting towns have already opposed it. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of late, you know. So I, I mean, uh, you know, I think now is the time to go on record in opposition of it 
And if they want to come in and talk at that point, then the onus is on them to do so to try to sway our opinion. But we need to come out in, uh, you know, in a unified voice uh, that we're concerned with the region. Mm -hmm. And you know, as it was previously stated, part of that property that the, this project's proposed on has conservation restrictions do, for water quality. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I don't even know how it cut the mustard on that. Uh, to, to, to propose such a project in, in an area that has a conservation restriction um, specifically for water quality. So, and, sure. and, and look, my, I'm the same, my vote is the same as all of you. I'd like to hear what they have to say. If there's a threat to the drinking water or our, our environment, I'm opposed to this. But I would like to have the conversation and know what, like to know what they talk they're talking about before I say no. Well, what we're but asking. I, I can tell you straight up, I am opposed to this if it's a threat to our drinking water, our environment. We're asking for an environmental study. I mean, well, what are gonna, I mean, I, Tom, I respect that view. They're gonna come in and tell you no problem. I mean, I've read their assessment. I've read their assessment. I've read the dismissal of the 400 comments that raise concerns. You can have them come in and tell you everything's fine. They can come in and look me in the eye and tell me everything's fine. I don't believe them. Okay, I sat there and listened to the science advisory committee meeting where they said on one particular compound in Tiffany, um, which is a highly toxic metal, that's not in the rounds we fire. That's true. It isn't the primer that helps ignite the bullet. It's not in the round, okay? So I don't really need to sit here and listen to a presentation where they're gonna parse their words about what's in the round and what's not in the round when it's present in the process of using that facility the way they've designed it. And then in that particular example, to have them also not tell me that they used to have groundwater monitors for that chemical mm -hmm. and they took them out. Well, why'd they take them out? We didn't talk about that. Um, so they don't have measurements on it and they'll tell you they don't have measurements on it in the groundwater. Why don't they have it? Because they removed the piezometers that would have told them whether it was there or not. So, I don't need to play that game. Yeah. They need to show what they used to do, which is, this is what we're doing, this is what the impact is, how do we manage it? Not play hide the ball. So, you know, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather send this letter, they wanna come in and argue us off that position, that's a different conversation. They're welcome to come in anytime they want. They've been invited by you in May, they'll show up in August, but we're not talking about that. Right. So they can come in when they want, and maybe this will motivate them to show up. I'll show up, I'll come to any meeting they want to come to and sit at a special meeting and listen to them as long as they want, as long as they're going to subject themselves to a full questioning, because I got a lot. <laughs> I've sat through a lot of these meetings. I got a long list. Okay, John. All right. Madam Chair. All right, so. Um, you know what it's like. I, <laughs> I agree with everything you said, Thank Andy. I have an honorable discharge already. <laughs> <laughs> so again, um, I, I have to agree with, you know, what everyone said, I, I mean, it's obviously drinking water. There's, there's so many reasons that I've, you know, this serious concern here. Um, you know, to say the least, it's been horrible communication. No question. And a, an arrogant threat that he, when he, when he, that he stated in the paper, you know, I, I took offense to that, that letter um, to the community, so I, that all being said, I mean, I, I still am battling inside to say, you know, time-wise, but I do understand, you know, your comment you just made, Andy, about, you know, if this maybe pushes them off a little bit and says, you know, we gotta, we have to talk to them because, you know, at the, the council meeting, we made it very clear he was right there at the Zoom, in the Zoom meeting, and he <coughs> didn't want to talk about it, and he did not want to talk about it with any single well, I town. Think, I think we need to talk about it a lot. That's, and so that being said, maybe this will be something that if we're kind of following suit with all the other towns, mm -hmm. and maybe this kind of pushes them into either they have to start communicating and tell us what their intentions are and why. <coughs> and again, again, I'm, the why, I'm all for training of our, our military personnel and things like that. I, I'm a little bit hesitant to say 
not in our backyard. Why, why our, not our, why someone else's back, why not someone else's backyard? I don't want to necessarily say that, necessarily say that, but there's a lot of answers that are needed for me to, you know, to in, fully endorse it. But I think, you know, maybe endorsing something like a letter like this, it, I, I think hopefully it'll push for some answers. And if not, <coughs> So be it. They they they're not they're not if they're not really to back up what they're trying to push, then I don't know what else to do because they they have we have asked and asked and asked. I personally have asked, and you know Andy was right there with me, and it it just got ignored, and it, that's that's a little bit of arrogance, and that kind of pisses me off. Let me read to you a snip from a email from me to Colonel from Coroner Porter to me in February. He were having, and I were having a discussion about this. Quote, the base does not intend to rush a signed finding of no significant impact, a necessary step in constructing the MPMG without first satisfying the public's reasonable thirst for information mm -hmm. and putting into place more effective means of community involvement on base activities. That was February. They've signed the finding of no significant impact. They haven't briefed the public outside of the confines of the comfort of their own living room um, once. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry. They've lost all credibility with me, and I think we have to say enough. If they want to come in and talk on our terms, get us off this letter, that's fine. I'd make a motion we approve the letter. And I'm sorry not to have unanimity on it. We work as a group best that way, but I think this one requires we need to vote our conscience on it. Do I have a second? Second. Roll call. John? Yes. Andy? Yes. 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 Okay. We're Thank you. Enemy. Thank you all. That is very good. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people are here to um, public comment on the NIP ban. So if I call your name and um, we're going to do a three-minute comment period. And, and you've got a lot of match be wake beef and, president okay. butters who are also here. So if you want to do them all at once? Yeah, that's okay. fine. Anyway, I got the clock. Okay. Dave Rumwell, New Seabury, you come up to the table. Uh, only just, Chair, if I may ask, um, get it, if you can give him like a 15-second, like... I'll give you a 30-second high sign. Okay. So if you can... Only because it does help with, I know we're going through this with the planning board meetings too, so. Okay. Go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Slayton. I don't think I need the 30 seconds, but thank you for your offer. <laughs> Listen, this is simple. I'm a new resident of Mashpee. I just came here a month ago. Mm -hmm. This is fun to see civics in action. I'm part of the board at Bridgewater. I, we're heavily involved in the social justice and civics, so it's nice to see you all here. It's a great audience. What so, board would you like to be on? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We will yeah, sign you up tonight. So I'm going to make this quick. Uh, listen, I understand what the goal is. I don't know all the facts. I wasn't here to read them all. I'm just, you want to stop behavior of the people throwing nips out their window. Sounds simple, right? You hate seeing them on the road. They're there. There's other trash on the road, but you want to pick this one and you just want to say out. It makes sense, but are you going after the people selling it or are you going after the people throwing out the window? So that's what I'm asking. What we should look at is we should look at what the state's doing right now. The state has a bill. It just got looked at 10 days ago. They've got the nips. They've got plastic straws. They've got everything you can imagine, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. This is a bad PR move for this town to ban it right now. Wait to see what the state does. Look what their advice is. Look what they get through, and then follow their suit. That's all I'm asking. It seems simple to me. Don't hurt the small business owner. Try to figure out a way to help everybody and solve the problem. Don't hurt people in the process because the people breaking the law are not the ones selling them. It's the ones throwing them out. I think I did that in nice time. You did great. Great right. job. Thank you. Well done. Karen Faulkner, Asher's Path. And you have three minutes. Um, <clears throat> Mashpee Commons expansion and redevelopment plan is wrong for Mashpee. We've reached a tipping point in Mashpee. I see you've got the Santuit Pond and the Wakeby Pond side of Mashpee 
listing cyanobacteria, health advisory, you can't swim there. Our waters are so polluted that the Conservation Law Foundation has sued the town as well as Barnesville and the Mass Department of Environmental Protection because we failed to prevent nitrogen pollution in our surface waters. PFAS is in our wastewater, in our watersheds. And on top of this, MASHB wants to build this big development. And we already know what the development is. With the approval of phase one of our wastewater treatment facility, from what I understand, it's gonna be 20 or more years before the entire town gets sewers. And in the meantime, the water is going to continue to grade. I am sick about this. The proposed development will just exacerbate our wastewater problem. I was gonna go into the, the we, we, I thought we were supposed to do a development agreement first. I thought that we agreed. And then we would, once we did that, then we'd do the zoning bylaw. But that's not the way it's going because somebody has said here, we'll do it in parallel. I, you know, I, I don't know why we just can't follow the rules. We should not be doing it this way. We have developers, bankers, contractors, real estate agents, the, the Mashby Chamber of Commerce, some members of the Mashby Planning Board, and some members of the selectmen who want swift approval of this plan. This is crazy. How can you argue swift approval of a plan when you have to draft a development agreement that is the most important agreement you will ever draft probably or write in this town? I mean, it's huge. I've been reading a lot of things about drafting agreements, and I'll come into that a little bit. Mashpee Commons has been less than transparent in telling us the details. Last week at the joint meeting, Mashpee, you know, the joint meeting we had, a number of simple questions were asked of the executive director of the Cape Cod uh, Commission. No answers were given, really. Someone asked the executive director, what's the height of the four and a half? 30 three, seconds left, Karen. Two and a half, pardon me? 30, 30 seconds, seconds left. left. your call. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and it, what the height would be. And I, the answer was something like, well, we'll discuss that on July 21. D does failure to respond to a simple question engender any trust and credibility with the Cape Cod Commission? I don't know, maybe you could speak to them about that. You know, a lot of, a big deal was made about the Chapter D, you know, the mandatory requirement to do all those things on the application for development. I mean, that's mandatory. And, and somebody said, oh, well, this is all brand new. We don't, you know, we, we haven't done this before. That's irrelevant. This, it, these are the rules. And just so you know, the commission cannot appoint a subcommittee to represent uh, the commission uh, unless there is a certified uh, development agreement done. Now, this part I hope is interesting to you. I looked at other development agreements in Massachusetts, specifically the new Quincy Center in Quincy, Mass, and the Assembly Square in Somerville, Mass. I note that these towns are very dissimilar to Mashpee. Unlike our year-round population of 14,000, Quincy has a population of 95,000. This is from 2019. Somerville, 81,000. Transportation in New Quincy Center and Assembly Square, they have trains, subway, and buses. We have buses, okay? So if Mashpee Commons builds their proposed development, we're gonna have even a bigger traffic problem no matter what Mashpee Commons does in mitigation. So conservatively, we have these 1,710 units. We're gonna have 3,500 more people, 3,500 more cars, and at least 2,500 more toilets. Development agreement of this magnitude is really not in the best interest of our town. Thank you. Thank you. I have a Robert, and I can't see the last name. It's Willow Bend Drive. Okay. Would you state your last? Last name, Robert? Robert Epstein. Epstein. I live at 165 Willow Bend Drive. And uh, I'm going to speak on the NIP situation. Uh, I'm the present CEO of Horizon Beverage Company. 
It's the fourth generation wholesale operation of alcoholic spirits. We cover five states with 1,000 employees. This is what I do every day. 77 years old, I, I live and eat the business. And I watch over my customers. <clears throat> Some of these families, I had their fathers as customers when I worked this territory. The action that you're about to decide on has to be put down on a personal basis. These are your friends. These are your neighbors. And the draconian action you, you want to employ, to me, is very, just too drastic. These are good people. They work, many of them, 80 hours a week servicing the customers. They've gone through a hell of a tough year, very tough year, as everybody has. And it just doesn't seem to me to be the, the neighborly thing to do, what you're suggesting, as opposed to hold off for a while, test them, test the retailers. And from my understanding, they've done yeoman work in addressing the problem. We've had victories, me, but the retailers in Attleboro, Plainville, and a number of towns who've done just that. Put yourself in their position. If you take away the NIP business, they're just going to go to another town. Now, there is legislative action to address the whole uh, refuse problem in the alcoholic beverage business. Uh, we cover Maine, Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. And in Maine, they were very aggressive, and their business has really suffered dramatically. Vermont's on the same pathway. They just hired a new commission. They're trying to dig their way out. When it came to drunk driving, and I was, you know, I was champion that thing nationally. I was head of the National Association. These retailers, your friends, they stepped up better than anywhere in the state. And I cover the entire state. They were first with the money. They were first with the energy. They were first with the ideas. And they've had a major impact on that. So these are really good people who shouldn't be denied the ability to make a living but to give them a chance to alter the behavior in managing the refuse problem. And that would be the right thing to do. Time will resolve this issue. I can tell you right now, I have documents on my desk that uh, in two years, you'll be drinking almost everything, not out of plastic, but out of paper. If you go into a package store today, you'll see a preponderance of cardboard or paper uh, bottles uh, from five liters to small ones. So the industry is moving in that direction, recycled seconds. and so on. So uh, I urge you not on the because I've been around a long time. But this is the right thing to do. And I live in Mashpee, and I think I want my representatives to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Brett? I'm good. My name is uh, Brett Rimsha, and I'm the uh, manager at South Cape Wine and Spirits next to Roach Brothers. So we can all agree that littering is a very big issue in the town of Mashpee, as it is around the world, around the country, everywhere. So I think that we should attack the issue at the core, together. This would consist of us educating members of the town, including as my customers. We are doing it as we speak. I have trained my staff to educate people who buy nips, to not throw them out and dispose of them properly. This would be a successful addition to our Clean Up Mashpee campaign, which we have been doing and we will continue to. <coughs> so if you are gracious enough to rethink your decision and extend your decision until maybe January 1st, you will see that our intentions are real. We are trying to attack the problem at the core, and we will continue to do this and show you that we are 100% committed to this issue. During that time, we'll be, we'll be working with the distributors as state representatives to hopefully pass a bottle bill. This will in, uh, incent customers and people walking their dogs, seeing them on the side of the road, to pick them up and bring them to a local liquor store or uh, redemption center. This will clean up the streets, and I just want you guys to know that we are working our best to figure this out. And I appreciate you giving me the time to speak, and I hope that you are willing to see the issue from our eyes and we will be stronger together than we will be divided. Thank you. Thank you. Dina. I'm Dina Rimsham, the co-owner of Liberty Liquors in Mashpee. Uh, when the Board of Selectmen voted in favor of a NIP ban in November, you said that you would also repeal the ban if the wine and spirits industry 
could provide a plan to address the litter problem at hand or if the state put up a deposit on NIPS. On May 28th, about a month ago, I submitted a plan to the Board of Selectmen detailing that the wine spirits community is doing to address the problem of the NIP litter in Nashby. I hope you all had a chance to read my plan. If not, I do have copies and I'd be glad to hand them out to you all. In this plan, we, de we detail our support for adding a deposit to NIP balls as the best long-term solution for addressing NIP litter, as you've heard from everybody else that has spoken here this evening. However, we were given less than eight months between passing the ban and its impl implementation during a pandemic. For a legislator and an industry that is dealing with the impacts of a pandemic, we feel that this is clearly not enough time to address the particular issue at hand. Because of this, we ask you that you repeal the ban or at least the very least delay implementing it to at least January 1st and allow us to continue our actions on doing cleanups. We're working our part we're working on a solution on our part. In the plan we submitted to you, we detail the efforts that we're undertaking. In partnership with Keep Massachusetts Beautiful, a nonprofit organization, we've held two community cleanups this year already, with our staff, friends, and family coming out to clean up all trash, not just litter, in the town of Mashby. We intend to continue these cleanups on at least a quarterly basis. We also are ded dedicated to educating our customers, making it clear to them that they risk losing their favorite items if they don't dispose of them properly. We have posters in our windows and materials at checkout that make this point clear and trying to educate them in that sense. We also agree that litter is an issue in the town of Mashburn and that there needs to be a long-term solution, but banning it is not the case. That is not the way to clean up litter. People who litter will continue to do so with or without a ban, and our customers will take their dollars to other towns to buy nips when they find that we are no longer selling them. These small balls can make up at least as much as 30% of sales, depending on the store. Banning them will cost business community hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales that they will have no way to make back. The potential negative consequences of a ban and promise at a state level solution is exactly what had similar bans to recently fail in Alvaro, Halifax. 30, 30 seconds, Tina. On behalf of the wine and spirits retailers in our town, I hope you've read and considered our plan to clean up Mashpee. Not only losing NIP sale, but we'll all be losing the peripheral sales that go along with the NIPs. People go to other towns, they want to do one-stop shopping. They don't want to make two stops. So if people are leaving our town to go and buy NIPs in another town, we're losing the peripheral sales that go along with that sale. We ask you, lastly, I'd also like to note that the liquor and wine industry is the only industry that has made any efforts to help reduce and clean up all litter, not only in the town of Mashpee, but in the whole state. Okay, it's Working with Keep Massachusetts Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Arden Russell. Hi, uh, hi, Arden Russell, Cadre and Sturgis Lane. Um, first, I was here to, um, to voice my support for the housing project at 950 um, Falmouth Road. Um, unfortunately, there was no opportunity for public comment, but I want to thank the Affordable Housing Trust um, for making that commitment to the project for much, much, much needed affordable housing in our town. Agreed. Um, and secondly, I'm here um, as a very fortunate um, person who's able to live on Mashby Wakeby Lake, and I am heartbroken um, that I can no longer swim in my lake. So. I thought I'd be following a lot of people and I was just gonna jump on their comments, but I wanna say that I'm, I'm urging you to take swift and strong action. I know there are discussions and ideas <coughs> about how to solve this problem. Um, some of those strategies might end up not being popular, um, but I think we have to expedite whatever it was we were thinking about doing to clean up these ponds and I'm urging you to, to take swift and strong action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to do a public hearing. Andrew? We, are you done with 640? comments? 6.40, yes, we're done. Oh, there's one more, at least I know at least one more person who the sign of she was gone. Yeah. Um, Sue Dangle? Sorry. Sue Dangle. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Susan Dangle from um, Mashby Wakeby Lake as well. I'm here tonight with... Um, a large number of residents from the lake who um, are very, very deeply concerned about the second algae bloom um, since September. In fact, most of us have been on the lake 30, 40, 50 years, and this has not happened before. 
So we are mostly concerned about the fact that as, a, as residents, we were not informed directly from the towns of this fact. We found out about it from a Facebook group or from our friendly selectmen from both towns on the lake. But there are many residents on the lake who do not know. And the answer is that we've been hearing is, well, the signs are posted. Well, that's nice if you're visiting the lake. But if you're living on the lake, you're in the lake daily. Your dogs are in the lake. Your kids are in the lake. And all of us on the north side of Wakeby have sat by for a week with nobody in the lake. Yet, people are bringing their boats in. They're out on the island still. They're partying. They're in the water. The harbor master's driving right by them. And why are they swimming and we're not swimming? So we've also been around to all of the different places. The, um, the trailheads, we've been to the boat ramp, we've been to the beaches, and the m messaging is mixed. Some, si some signs are missing. Some signs have been torn down. The signs kind of look like a lost dog, not a very big caution about the, lake, the safety of the lake. And today I stopped at Ryder Conservation to see if I could go down and take a picture of the, the signs down there. And they said, oh, well, we're open. We've tested. Our water's safe. I said, oh, really? Well, how did, we, how did you know that? And why don't we know that? Well, we test it every day. And it's safe. Dave told us we could let the people swim. We just tell them not to swallow or let their kids or dogs in. So. I really think now that we are sitting faced with eight weeks of this busiest time on this lake, we don't have a communication plan. We don't have a way of notifying many residents who are bringing renters in. This is really the busiest week of our year. And I know we're going to see tons of boats, tons of people. And we're very concerned. So we have really mobilized. I think we've taken Andrew and Dave's um, recommendations to mobilize as a citizen group and become partners with you and help you. 30 seconds, so. Okay, we're gonna do everything we can. We want, to, uh, we want to educate ourselves, we want help, but we need help immediately. We really need the towns to come together and be consistent in what the message is. We need a way to find out where we're gonna get that information. And we need, I would think, an emergency resident meeting with officials from both towns to tell us and answer our questions because we have many, many questions about how we're going to handle this. And thank you. lastly, I do wanna thank you all because I know you're facing many issues and I know you've worked very hard on this issue in particular and the wastewater treatment's gonna go a long way. But there's many other things that we can do. We would like to help you. We can volunteer to take samples or whatever you need us to do. We stand ready, but we would really like to um, be in touch swiftly on a meeting, a resident meeting. Thank you, Sue. And <laughs> lastly, we have Dave Simpson. Samson. Samson, who is a sandwich selectman and lives on the other side. Of Wakeby Pond. Good evening, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board. I'm David definitely Samson. timing you, Dave. You're timing. <laughs> Thirty minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 14, 14 Cove Road in Sandwich. Uh, first, I, I listened to your discussion about the machine gun range. I fully support your position. Uh, you made up a, made a lot of valid points there about the challenges that we've had as public officials in not receiving the right information regarding that project. Um, however, that's not why I'm here tonight. I am here tonight. Uh, to, just as uh, for awareness about the issue with the lake with the cyanobacteria, uh, again, we all are very well aware that this has been a problem that has been coming forward for a long time. And unfortunately, we are now seeing the results of projects that have been put off for years and, and nitrogen pollution that is impacting our fresh water. Um, I'm here tonight, and um, I'm usually here as the face of a lot of the lake neighbors, as you know. But when I arrive tonight, it's very refreshing to see the number of my neighbors that are here. And I just ask for those folks to please raise their hands. Tremendous showing of our folks from the lake tonight. I know these folks are very uh, willing and committed to do what they can. And as a selectman in Sandwich, I've been liaising with Andrew uh, consistently over the last couple of weeks. But I will also bring uh, any required messaging back to our board, uh, as well as any public officials in the town of Sandwich. Um, we are very ready to collaborate and work together to resolve this, these issues. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.
And that is on our agenda to yeah, discuss Yeah, so stick tonight. around. We're going to so be talking wanna, about this in a little bit. Okay. So we're going to do a public hearing, liquor license amendment, application of Better Foods, LLC, doing business as Sienna 17 Steeple Street. Andrew? Signed it. Two minutes. I did not see a sign up sheet. Lynn Barbie, Surf Drive, Mashpee. Uh, some people who are in the room won't recognize this, but um, Madam Chair and the Selectmen, I want to thank you for your attention at this juncture to the process of the Mashpee Commons expansion. Last week's meeting with the Planning Board and the Cape Cod Commission was very helpful. First, it was reassuring that you corrected the Cape Cod Commission's assertion that the zoning process would, pre, would precede, cor corrected the assertion that the zoning process would precede the development agreement. It was surprising that she had it wrong. But about the development agreement, does the Cape Cod Commission have a copy of the Mashpee Commons proposal? The director implied they do because she said they are working on it. If the Cape Cod Commission has it, why doesn't the town of Mashpee, that is the planning board, have a copy of it? This is supposed to be a three-party process, but currently only two parties, Mashpee Commons and the Cape Cod Commission, know any details of the development plan. Why? The planning board cannot do its job without the development agreement proposal. They cannot proceed with impact reviews until the full proposal is on the table. It seems the, Chamber of, the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce may also have a copy as their outgoing executive officer alleged that the development agreement, quote, will deliver significant affordable and workforce housing stock, unquote. Maybe the chamber knows something we don't know as the incoming executive director is a consultant to Mashpee Commons. The chamber is not an impartial body in this process, so their urging, quote, swift, swift approval, unquote, is unhelpful. We know there are open permits for Mashpee Commons to build affordable housing. If they are so anxious to get started, they can and should. Mashpee Commons can follow Chairwoman Sherman's advice to, quote, be patient, unquote, with this new expansion plan. We, the residents, taxpayers, and voters of Mashpee want to get this right, and the process is off track. Remember, the horse must precede the cart, and the horse is mysteriously missing. And I want to echo everyone S's comments about the lake. I was almost in tears Thursday when I went down there to swim, and I couldn't. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. I apologize. I didn't uh, see the sign-up sheet either. I'll only take two minutes of your time also on the headband. Yeah. And this is the last one. What I'm is sorry. your name? Mike Cartwell. Ships run a drive. Nashby. Um, I, I've uh, been a resident of Mashpee for 31 years, and for 37 years I've been working for Mr. Epstein's uh, liquor distributor, and I've delivered to numerous folks in this, in this room, and they're beautiful customers, and I can attest, I happen to be on a route Friday um, that started in Mashpee, went down to Centerville, through Mashpee again, and over into Falmouth, and the, the, uh, all the package stores on out of Bud Mashby, certainly we're getting many, many nips. Um, I, uh, I think it's going to certainly affect your, your uh, folks of this, this town. Um, I, uh, not a great at public speaking, but I mean, um, I just, uh, I believe that, you know, you, you put it off until, you know, maybe the beginning of the year. Um, you know, one of the gentlemen was talking about, you know, the state's going to look at something. Um, and it's just, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the heat of the summer is the busiest time of the year, um, and, and just give it time, you know, think it through. Thank you, and thanks for your service to this town. Thank you. Okay. Can we read the hearing notes? Please. Pursuant to Chapter 138 of Massachusetts General Laws, the Board of Selectmen acting as local licensing authority for the town of Mashby will conduct a public hearing on the liquor license amendment application of Better Food LLC, DBA Siena, 17 Steeple Street, Mashpee, Mass, 02649, Graham Stilliman, Manager for Alteration of Premises. Said hearing will be held on Monday, June 28, 2021, at 640, or closely, um, in the Mass in the Wacoit Meeting Room, Mashpee Town Hall, 16 Great Neck Road North, Mashpee, Mass, 02649. Comments can be submitted via email to bos at mashpeemass.gov prior to the meeting time and date. 
Madam Chair, if I may for a second. Sorry. Okay. Before you, uh, just I'd like to disclose full disclosure. Um, my three kids actually are employed by Sienna and have been long time employment. Okay. Out of full disclosure, I feel that I can make uh, impartial okay. judgment on the situation. But I want thank to disclose you. that. And thank you for your patience. Thanks, Grant. I feel like this is going to be so boring. <laughs> so, so, so wait a minute. I don't know if I should jump in and full disclosure. I had repaired a ceiling um, at the uh, Sienna a year ago. I think a little stronger than that, but um, it was just a repair, not a big deal. Um, but well, it's good that we disclose. Yep. Thank you, Thanks. both of you, for doing <laughs> that. So basically, what we're looking at tonight is a plan for our patio after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just, this is a standard thing that we have to do. Even if you just move tables around, um, it is technically a renovation under the ABCC guidelines. And we're actually gonna address a little of that, uh, what is a change and what isn't as part of the application. Um, I think the easiest way to understand what we're doing is, there's one page in your packet that's color. <coughs> if you wanna turn to that, that sort of sums up what's happening. I don't think we have this year, as just part of regular construction and ongoing improvements and maintenance, Mashpee Commons jackhammered everything in front of the restaurant, and that included our patio, and that led us to make certain changes. So if you look at the page, at the bottom, uh, hold it the, the long way, at the bottom it's red, and at the top it's green, and what you're looking at is, is in front of the restaurant, going from right to left, um, across where the red is, that's the walkway that goes from the parking lot towards Bobby Burroughs, okay? And then above that, you see that curve, it starts with Sienna, and there's our front door, and then up to the left, going to the top of the page, that's where Regal Cinemas is, just to orient you, mm -hmm. okay? So last year, the area that's in red, that was our patio, mm -hmm. um, and it include, included the middle section that's white. Basically, the change that's happening is we're losing the red and we're moving to where the green is. Mashpee Commons, when they did all their um, changes to the patio, um, we changed the surface. We now have a safer surface for our tables and for our chairs. They're, it's a large, um, uh, high traction concrete slabs. Um, not the prettiest thing that Mashpee Commons wanted, but we presented them that, look, tables won't wobble, people won't get the chair leg caught on a brick when they push their chair back and fall over. Mm -hmm. So they changed where that design was. The other thing was we um, took out, um, we, we are going to take out all of our propane heaters because we were able to put in gas lines under the patio. Uh, fire department's very happy about that. Um, and we don't have people hauling propane across the parking lot anymore. At least we won't as soon as that arrives from China. Um, so, um, so basically it's not a huge change in square footage, it's a shift. Um, we're also moving further out of the pedestrian traffic area um, th where people walk from the parking lot into the middle of Mashpee Commons. Um, <clears throat> not a huge change in seating, although technically it looks like it from last year because last year we were dealing with six foot separation of tables, all right? The building code requirement for this, which is called loose tables and chairs, is 15 square feet per seat. We are well under that for the total square footage of the patio. Um, the final thing that is a change that we've done is there, there, there was a big kiosk near the, the street in our patio space. That's been removed and they've put in an electrical box for us we are gonna get um, something that is basically like a small shipping container. It's 10 by 18. And that is gonna have some counter seating like bar seating, and it's going to add a weight station as well. Um, one of the things that came out of the, the pandemic, it's always been kind of an annoyance during the summer, but it was a serious annoyance, and we think even when the pandemic ends, customers are still kind of skittish about it, is if you look at this point, on the diagram, that's the door to Sienna. That is the door for everything at Sienna. You go there to see the host, you go there to go to the bathroom, the servers go through there to go get uh, food uh, and bring it out to customers, dirty dishes go through there. That is a really serious choke point. We did get um, significant complaints 
Um, and we, we had reports go to, for example, the Board of Health during the pandemic that, that this is too crowded. Um, and they're right. Um, and we felt that, you know, going forward, our patio is very busy. We've got to do things to mitigate that. We do take the, the patio very seriously. One point I will tell you, because this just happened yesterday, um, in the issue of Boston Magazine about to come out, they have an article of 11 amazing restaurant patios for outdoor dining on Cape Cod. We're on that list. We're the only one from Mashpee um, and the only one on the Upper Cape that is not on the water. Okay, so it, I mean, it's recognized as being pretty good and we want to keep it good. Um, we have to do things to manage service. Um, the, the container will have seating. It's going to look nice. Um, um, it's going to have a mural on it. Um, but also, it, it acts as a shuttle station for us to, to um, not have to go through that vestibule with dirty dishes um, during peak hours. Okay. Um, so, Graham, are you adding another entrance? Uh, no, we can't really do that. We looked into it. it, it that's beyond our means. Okay. Um, so we're keeping the entrance. We're just trying to de-emphasize it at peak times. Okay. We're, we're, we're putting in um, an, you know, an additional service point. So they won't be going in and out, in and out. Well, we're reducing it. People reducing. still, I mean, that's okay. where the bathrooms yeah. are. Um, we have added a host station outside um, to kind of divert people. Are you adding any extra seating? Um, we are adding compared to the pandemic. But from the, the origin, are, from the original license? Uh, yes, because this is more square footage. Okay. This is the, the, when with the pandemic, working with Mashpee Commons, mm -hmm. they increased the square footage of our patio, okay? Um, and now with the redesign, it's still that increased square footage. It's just shifted out of the traffic lane. So how many more tables or? I don't know how many more exactly. It's the, the total is 124. And if you did, the bar will be it's 2,400 square feet at 15 square feet per seat. Um, it could be licensed for 160. We did 124. Questions? What is the Board of Health is good with it? I know we had a, an issue a few years ago, but I think because they're putting the bar counter out something. there. They put in a what? Because now you're putting the bar counter out there, the counter. So that eliminates. Um, the Board of Health has been shown it. Mm -hmm. uh, the fire chief has seen it. The building commissioner has seen it. And there were no, no problems? No problems. No. Um, in fact, it, there, I did that as a courtesy, especially with building and fire, because of the extra inspection that we get for our liquor license. The actual building permit, I've learned, this is a module. It's very, it's very basic, it's very simple, and it's basically regulated the way the mobile home industry is regulated, or shipping containers. So the state actually regulates the construction. Um, because it could go, it actually is temporary. It could be moved. So uh, we are, we're bolting it to the sidewalk, but. Has the design <clears throat> review looked at it? Um, I don't know if the design and review would, would have to would look at it. Be I'm not sure. The required to look at it? Under their I don't think no. it's under It's there. a container. Yeah. For, uh, like, I've tried to ask around, and again, I've reached out. We've, we've stood in that spot where it's going to go with mm -hmm. the drawings. With the, with the new building commissioner okay. and um, with the fire chief and um, Glenn um, and uh, and everybody's it's okay. Extremely basic. Okay. Any other I'm not questions? Not aware of any issues no, at all. In fact, I, uh, I'm not either. He's, okay. He's been yes good to work with in the past. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Public comment. Do I have public comment on this issue? I make a motion to close the public hearing. A second. second. Roll call? Yes. 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 I need a motion. Did you see that? Did you see that? I'll make a motion to approve the um, change as requested. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Roll call. 
Tom? Yes. David? Yes. 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 You're good. I'm a yes if the board has no okay. issues. Well, That's my fine. Concern. You're all set. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good luck. <coughs> okay. Discussion of the July 1st, 2021 ban on the sale of alcohol nips. Huh. Did you get it? We got a visitor. I know. Is that a hornet? Wasp. A wasp. Oof. Maybe I'll let them out the door. The side Maybe let's keep their eye on it. I know. Please. <laughs> okay. Discussion of the nip ban. John, do you want to start? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you want to want me to, you know, it's come to my understanding that, um, you know, we have a, a state rep and we also have a state senator who represents Mashpee. Um, and it's, if you don't mind, I'll. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there has been no communication from Mashpee liquor stores concerning the um, the bottle bill or anything pertaining to the nip ban. Um, that's somewhat concerning. I do appreciate the cleanups that were conducted, but from my understanding, and it's according directly from um, uh, Senator Sear and David Vieira, there has been no communication uh, requesting their support of um, you know, delaying or any discussion about the nip ban. Um, so I'm just gonna, that's my statement. Tom? Um, my feelings are the same as when they were initially. I don't think the, um, the merchants has anything to do with the, the, the uh, illegal dumping or throwing a disposal of any of these nip bottles or any bottles for that matter. Um, their job is to sell it. I think uh, the enforcement is up. The town should be enforcing it. If the police see them throwing somebody throwing litter, they ought to be pulled over and written a ticket for for throwing throwing trash away on the street. Um, it's I don't see any reason why the the merchants should be penalized on this at all. I think they have mentioned it many times. I think there ought to be a 25 cent deposit on every bottle and um, make it worthwhile. Bend it over to pick it up. You'll see less of it sitting on the side of the road, I'll guarantee that. But um, that's where I stand. I, um, I don't think we're going after the right person. I think we should be going after the perpetrator with who throws that trash on the, on the uh, side of the road. That's it. Andrew? I have nothing. You have nothing, and David? Um, yeah, I, I pretty much feel the same is that we're not going after the actual consumer who's uh, doing the offense. Um, I feel like it is misdirecting the punishment. Um, and I do think that, you know, if, if we ban the NIPs, then one of two things. They're going to travel to surrounding towns and still purchase the NIPs on their way back into town, or they're going to uh, ups, upsize and buy the next size up, and we'll start finding more bottles um, of those sizes along our roadways. So um, I don't think this is an ideal situ um, solution. Um, I would be in favor of delaying it until um, January 1st to see what the legislature does. I would advise, in, in if we take that uh, route, then I would uh, request the board send a letter of support in encouraging them to adopt the legislation um, as a solution, as an alternative solution. Um, to provide, you know, opportunity for folks to, um, you know, uh, address the issues and see how some of the uh, cleanup campaigns continue on and if there's more buy-in from the industry. Thank you. <coughs> we don't have public comment right now. It's a discussion within the board. So do we want to do a, a motion or how do we want to start? Well, without a motion to do something different, the ban goes into effect on Thursday. Right. The ban will go into effect on Thursday unless we do something. So I don't know which way the board feels that they want to handle this. 
I would make a motion to uh, push it out to January 1st. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Roll call? No. No. Yes. Yes. No. So the ban will take effect July 1st. Okay, update. Update on the blooms in the Mashpee, Wake Bee, and Santua Pond. DNR Director Ashley Fisher. Ashley. Just give me a moment. <laughs> okay. Have some bad news and good news. Got it. <laughs> what was that? She killed it. Killed the war. Oh, did she? Don't mess with Sue. <laughs> Are we ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> did you kill the bug? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I think so. I think they got it. I should have gotten it. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> um, so, good evening. I'm Ashley Fisher. I'm the director of natural resources for the town of Mashpee. I'm here to update the board and the public on the cyanobacteria blooms taking place in Mashpee, Wakeby, and Santua Pond. Okay. So this is more for the public. Um, I know that the board is probably familiar with what causes these cyanobacteria blooms. Um, so what is causing these blooms is the light availability during the summer months, the water temperature, the increase in water temperature during the summer months, and the alteration of the water flow the vertical mixing, pH changes, and most importantly, nutrient loading. And that's both nitrogen and phosphorus. Trace metals have known to contribute, but they are um, negligent when it's compared to nitrogen. Um, the EPA quotes that it is highly, widely known and expected and accepted, sorry, by the scientific community that the incidence of harmful algae blooms will increase in both the US and worldwide. The increasing anthropogenic changes, that's human interactions with our land use, um, will affect and contribute to growth of cyanobacteria blooms if we do not change our land use practices. So this is uh, textbook pictures of a cyanobacteria bloom. As you can see, the pigment of the water column can vary. It can be light green to a very fluorescent, almost highlighter green. So when we are going along the waterways, we do like to pay attention to scum layers. And this is one of the criteria through DPH where we will put an advisory posting up. Um, these are pretty high cell count blooms here. This is probably exceeding the threshold. So um, the Mass Department of Public Health states when in doubt, stay out. And I just got off the phone with uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And if there's any, ever any question that we post an advisory based on the presence of a scum layer. So this is more for the public. Um, the Mass Department of Public Health has guidelines that are, that are set for posting an advisory. One that being is a scum layer, the presence of a scum layer, which I just showed you, um, and the cell counts that exceed 70,000 cells per milliliter. Now when we take our cell counts, we're taking a known volume and we're counting the amount of cells within a, a slide. So that's a, um, a counting cell or a, um, through a microscope and if it exceeds 70,000 cells per milliliter, we will post an advisory. The other threshold is microcystin level. That is a toxin that is known to be present with cyanobacteria blooms. And when that exceeds 14 parts per billion, we would post an advisory. This threshold is going to be reduced by the Mass Department of Public Health into eight parts per billion in the future. So just an update on Santua Pond. Um, this is our cell counts, our most recent information that we've collected from Santua Pond. As you can see, the water temperatures have increased dramatically. Um, on 531, the water temperature was 17 degrees C, and not even a month later, it was 26 degrees C. Um, that's when we had posted the advisory and when we saw a scum layer present on the shoreline. Scum layers are highly driven by the wind, and they can accumulate in the shoreline. This is 
why we are so concerned because this is where people enter the water with their pets, their children, and their families. Um, the dominant species we're seeing in Santuit Pond is Warnichia and Eglinenia, and it has a low toxicity. And we've gone out and we've tested it, and microcystin, which is um, the, one of the toxins that we test for, was below the threshold and or non detected by the state. When we took our sample to Woods Hole Oceanographic, it was at 0 0.84 parts per billion. So that is less than one part per billion and the way below the 14 part per billion threshold. So on 622, this is our most recent sample. There was no scum layer present, but the cell counts are on the rise. Um, the dominant species switched over to a known toxic species, um, and the water temperatures have further warmed to 80 degrees. So at this current time, we have samples that we've submitted to Don Anderson's lab at Woods Hole Oceanographic, and he will be doing HPLC, I'll explain what that testing is later, um, on the samples to run for all toxins that are known to be cyanotoxins or toxins produced by cyanobacteria. So I will have the results um, to be determined. We'll see when they come back. Um, HPLC is a very difficult test um, because there is just lack of standards available to the scientific community. So we'll see. Ashley, no, we have posted. We posted on Santua Pond, and we posted on the, um, the Mashpee Wakeby side. I'm sorry, both Mashpee and Wakeby side. Um, that was the health department who posted the signage at Attaquin Beach and at Low Holly. Is there a way that we can put stickers on people's homes, like people renting? People well, it, come in, yeah. they, don't, they don't know. So we do alert the newspaper. It was actually picked up by um, the Boston News Channel, um, and we have it on our town website and the Department of Natural Resources website. So it's available online, and we did post it on the Mashpee message and our town Facebook page. Channel 18? I believe it was Channel 18. I think it might have been Channel 5, actually. Uh, I'm sorry, Channel our, 5, like Boston. And then our local, you should probably The local Mashpee, local Mashpee TV Mashpee station, TV if station. there could be an announcement on that. An announcement on the yeah. local channel. I was wondering, uh, on the Sand to it Pond slide, um, were, were the tests all done at a consistent location? Um, yes. We have two sample locations. Um, we have one at the town landing, and we have one at our residence house who, who loans his dock for our um, sound units, which are water quality testing devices. Um, so we have two locations. One is off the Bryant's Neck, and one is at um, Mashpee Neck, uh, sorry, the Santuit Pond boat launch. So we use those two sites to test. Right. And the, is the, the wind consistent with um, pushing in that direction? We see um, more of a scum layer of the Bryant's Neck area. So when we see the scum layer over in, um, by the boat launch, it's just which way the wind blows. It kind of but moves it's it around. Be higher concentrations where the wind's the pushing line. it. Yes, Correct. absolutely. Rodney? I think it's uh, very important to get this information out. And oh, no I question. listened intently uh, to the woman earlier um, that uh, indicated that she uh, wasn't aware. Uh, the signs are great. Uh, putting it on Facebook is great. Uh, getting it out to the newspapers, putting it on our website. But I think um, we can do uh, better in terms of communication, and we need to do better. Um, maybe there could be a group email system. Maybe there's some contacts that the town can develop. Uh, at various locations um, so that we're kind of keeping people uh, better informed because uh, certainly the last thing we want to do is uh, put ourselves in a position where uh, the public is not fully informed. aware of the situation we're dealing with. So um, we can and we will do better. Ashley, is there anything that we can tell the public not to do to prevent this? Well, just adhere to the nitrogen bylaw and you know, pay attention to what you're putting in your yard. Excess fertilizer, fertilizer. is, is let me, let me a say huge problem. Let me say what Ashley won't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the, 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 this phenomenon is driven by two things. Overfeeding the system, too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus, septic systems, road runoff, fertilizers, um, and heat. 
world's getting warmer. Not a lot any of us can do about the heat. Um, what you can do in the short term, um, stop fertilizing your lawn. Period, full stop, end of conversation. Don't fertilize your lawn. All right, our nitrogen control bylaw limits applications of fertilizer. It doesn't ban them. When you fertilize, some percentage of the fertilizer makes it to the water. If you fertilize close to the water and it rains before the plants have had a chance to uptake that nitrogen, phosphorus, it goes in the water. If it doesn't rain that much and you water it, it percolates through the soil. Some of it's taken up by the plants. That which doesn't goes to the water. So when do they let you fertilize? Well, the bylaw allows you to fertilize from April 15th until October 15th. My point is Don't we need to stop fertilizing our lawns. If you like a green pond, then you can have a green lawn. If you don't want a green pond, you don't have a green lawn. Or you don't have a putting green lawn. Add some clover. I mean, there's a bunch of other ways to make your lawn look okay. It doesn't have to be a putting green. And those of you who live around the lake know whose lawns I'm talking about. Um, it's abundantly clear which ones those are. But all of us, and I'd like to see the board send a message out to all of our home, all of our residents, all of our property owners, to advise them that both in the marine side and the freshwater side, Nutrients are killing our waterways. You can't solve the problem by stopping fertilizing. We need to deal with the septic system contamination that's coming too. But that's going to take a while. That's a very expensive. It's very time consuming. You can stop fertilizing tomorrow. It doesn't cost you anything to stop fertilizing. In fact, it saves you money because you're not buying the fertilizer and you're not mowing your lawn every seven days. Um, so I'd like to see us, as an immediate action, put out an advisory on a broad scale, same people that get property tax bills, to just say, from a water quality perspective, this isn't the silver bullet, but it's an important thing that you can do in the short term that will maybe take the edge off and keep these systems a little bit before tipping over. Because right now, every single one of our water bodies in town in the last 12 months has tipped over. Every single one of them. So that's one action we can take. It's hard for Ashley, it's hard for staff to say that, but I'm telling you, that is an easy, simple, do no harm. I'm sorry if your lawn turns brown, it'll come back in the fall when it starts to rain. Um, that's an easy, simple thing we can do that will save our water quality, prevent these ponds from going into just a repeating cycle of decline, and every time it gets worse, and when it comes back, it doesn't come back as much, and every time it cycles into crisis, it cycles deeper into crisis. So that's one thing we can do. Um, the other thing that I'll put out there, and I'll just be blunt about it, um, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't tend to jump into the Facebook conversations, but I read it. Um, and, you know, my organization, I think everybody knows what I do for a living. I run the Association of Preserve Cape Cod. We do a lot of the cyanobacteria monitoring for a lot of towns. We don't do it for Mashby. Um, so whoever out there thinks that somehow my organization benefits from this crisis actually has the facts wrong. But notwithstanding that, in the interest of full disclosure, we do this. We do it under contract for a number of communities. We do it under contract for a number of water associations. We're active in all 15 towns on Cape Cod. Um, it's not a substitute for the towns doing a better job communicating, but I will tell you Mashpee is not unique. I work with every one of the 15 towns. Every town struggles with how do you communicate this issue to the public? How do you reach people? Who do you reach? How do you reach a transitory population? How do you reach people that come here to tune out? They don't want to read the paper. They don't want to turn on the local news. They're here for other reasons. Um, how do you uh, reach those people and provide them what is a very complex messaging about a very complex problem that changes. Just look at the, look at the species domination in Santua Pond that, that Ashley's talking about. It changes, it can change tomorrow from what it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And depending on what's dominant, it's really toxic or it's not that toxic. It can look the same to the naked eye. So it's really hard. So I agree, we can do better. We can do a lot better. It doesn't make us any better that we're, or it make you any feel any better that we're not as good at this as every one of the other 14 towns on Cape Cod. In the interim, and I'm not asking for your money, I'm not asking for donations, I'm telling you, 
If you go on our APCC.org website, we have a listserv. You will get an email from us when any one of the ponds that we're actively monitoring goes into the high category. That will at least tell you which ones are a problem. We publish a map. I'm not saying it should be an alternative to the town's capability. We should do better as a community than I can do as a nonprofit. Um, but in the interim, if you're interested, there is a source of public information that doesn't cost you a dime um, that will alert you to what's going on in every one of the ponds that we're sampling. And we're only sampling 15% of the ponds on Cape Cod, but we're doing 15% more than just about everybody else. One question, um, would, the, uh, would these ponds, uh, um, you know, hitting the tipping point, um, would it be beneficial to encourage people to pump septic systems around the, uh, around the lakes? It doesn't hurt, but it doesn't solve the problem. It? it doesn't really, I mean, eventually, you know, you're talking about, you know, your septic system is designed to take nutrient-laden wastewater into the groundwater. Right. That's what it's designed to do. So unless you want to pump every two weeks so it never flows into the leaching pit, it's not going to make that much difference. My concern, my concern is that with COVID that we may have uh, increased year-round residency in 2020 mm -hmm. where people came back from you know, uh, their primary homes uh, because they were able to work remotely and, and, and there may be an influx of you know, uh, increased sewage. In it, the it's system. absolutely true, so David. There's the, based on public water supply statistics across the Cape population, water use went up about 10% yeah. in year over year last year. And a lot of that is attributed to the longer duration of people's presence on, on the Cape using homes that were used for a lesser period of time. And that clearly increases the nitrogen loading or the nutrient loading that's happening to the ground. <clears throat> the other thing is a lot of people when they were home or working from home or not working because they couldn't get to work or didn't have a job. Um, one of the things a lot of people do is they took refuge in their yards. They worked on their yards a lot and they put down a lot of fertilizer. Um, so, you know, nobody, nobody sets out to hurt the pond. <coughs> but there's a lot of things we do as a society and as individuals that unknowingly contribute to the degradation of the resource that's the reason we're here. So just stop fertilizing you want. You want to do something tomorrow? Stop fertilizing your lawn. Maybe when it rains hard next week or Thursday or Friday and Saturday on a nice holiday weekend, some of that fertilizer that you didn't put on your grass oh. won't get into the pond and won't cause this thing to rebound back up. And that, that's exactly what will happen. We've seen that in Santuit Pond with the excess rainfall. I mean, but that's not the only contributing factor. Can you run, run through what's run going up. on in Mashby? Just Mashby, wait yeah, you didn't get to that. Yeah, we got to go to Mashpee Wakeby now. <laughs> okay, so Mashpee Wakeby was unique. We did see a uh, cyanobacteria bloom that was first reported and seen on the Wakeby side of the pond. Um, and this dominant species is this Dolichospermum species that we have never seen in the town of Mashpee before. Um, this species it has a uh, wealth of literature uh, focused around it that it, shows it does contain saxitoxins, anatoxins, microcystins, and other cyanotoxins that are known. Um, actually, some, where does that come from? It, that it's species, species dominance can switch at any moment. Like we just said, it, it can flop depending on the conditions. So you have warmer temperatures. We're seeing warmer waters. Our waters are 80.6 80, 80 degrees in early June. That is almost unheard of. That's way too soon. Um, and weather conditions, we can be at a drought. So drought can also contribute to cyanobacteria blooms and the species dominance. Um, so we were concerned about this particular species. So we reached out to the scientific community to assist in um, talk screens. So at this current time, we have lead harmful algae bloom scientist on this. Uh, Don Anderson, he is the red tide guy at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic, and his lab is working on this. Um, they're looking at uh, different toxins, but it's, it's difficult because the standards aren't readily available. So when you're testing these cells, and if you don't have anything to compare it to, um, they have to almost create their own standards. So that's what they're doing right now at uh, Woods Hole. So what does PSB stand for? Paralytic shellfish poisoning. So saxitoxins do produce paralytic shellfish poisoning. Uh, we were concerned that, well, our water bodies are all connected. So 
Mashpee wake, make be, wake be flushes into the Mashpee River, which ultimately gets down to our oyster beds into Papanasset Bay and can contaminate our shellfish at higher levels. Um, but are those checked? Those are checked. I've, we're sending in samples okay. to the Division of Marine Fisheries. I had some issues with communicating with them, um, but they are going to take the mussels from uh, Mashpee Wakeby and test them for saxitoxins, um, in particular the ones that cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, this first happened where somebody um, got the paralysis on uh, Martha's Vineyard from Dolichospermum species that was freshwater that did leak into an estuary. Um, and he experienced numbness and just, um, you know, minor dermatitis. Um, but you will have symptoms as fever, eye irritation, abdominal pain, skin rash, which is why we're recommending that children and animals stay away from the water. Um, I do have good news. The cell counts have remained below the threshold, and the most recent data is that it is below 4,000 cells per milliliter, the no scum layer on the Mashpee side, and the particulates have disappeared from the Mashpee side. They, are, they do remain on the Wakebee side, but we're paying attention to the bloom and the cell counts. Um, I've communicated with Mass Department of Public Health, and they are supporting the town of Mashpee for the advisory posting. It's better safe to be sorry. They say if you have any doubt, post the advisory. They're going to um, work with us. The Division of Marine Fisheries is working with us, and Woods Hole Oceanographic is working with us. And we're helping to develop the technology, too, for, for future towns. So the standards will come from this, too. We were highly concerned because upon inspection, we did find dead mussels that were gaping at the shoreline and catfish that were popping out of the water. Um, so we acted immediately. Um, it's better safe to be sorry. It's better safe than to be sorry. Um, and we wanted to keep the public away. Um, the utmost importance is public safety with these blooms. Um, I myself am a, a butter Mashpee Wake Bee, so it's very concerning to me, and I am concerned about the public. So we sent these mussels in. We tried to send the catfish in. He didn't make it. He was too far gone by the time. Um, but we're going to be sending the mussels into the division. So this is initial uh, toxin analysis from the pond. Um, Woods Hole Oceanographic is doing a high-performance liquid chromatography. Um, this is a standard method for testing. Um, and then, like I said, it's Don Anderson's lab at Woods Hole Oceanographic and the Center of Oceans of Human Health. Um, we're also working with Ramon Spectroscopy from Scott Gallagher's lab at Woods Hole Oceanographic. And we did reach out to the APCC to connect to conduct the Abraxas test will give, that will give us concentrations of microcystis. And the good news is it was below the threshold and was at one part per billion. So for future work, we're just waiting on the HPLC test. And like I said, this is a very difficult test. It does take time. And unfortunately, when you want it to go fast, it never does. Um, but we'll get accurate testing results within the week. So, and, and, and actually, what that's going to tell you, right, is what was in the water last Wednesday. We took samples on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Okay. So you're going to get talks from all three? Yes. Okay. Um, and we'll continue. We're going to go out um, and collect the 30 mussels. We're going to test them for paralytic shellfish poisoning or saxitoxin bioassay. Um, we're going to monitor, we're going to continue to monitor cell counts almost every other day because we're at um, a week almost a week of no scum layer and low cell counts. Um, so if there's any other evidence of toxins, and if we receive the information back that toxin levels that are saxitoxins or anatoxins are higher than what we should see in an environment or a water body that isn't even eutrophic, uh, we'll need to work further with uh, the Department of Public Health to see what we're going to do. Now, the next few days are supposed to be very, very warm, and then we're supposed to have two days of rain rain mm -hmm. so that's going to make it worse who but, knows i mean sustained temperatures at 90 something degrees can't help it no no because uh, it's growing you know and then the rain's gonna the uh, rain's gonna make it travel so right. let me ask you this what can we do now to help prevent this from happening this week this coming week or the following week what actions can we take right oh. now no well, fertilizer I think, I think andy gottlieb said it <laughs> No fertilizer, and I know, you know, there's other practices that you can do. Like in with people who do abut the lake, we've seen, we did lake surveys, there is lack of buffer zones in some of these properties. 
they have green, green grass right down to the waterfront with no plant matter to take up any of the nutrients before it enters into the waterways. Um, so if people want to go out and plant a shrub, I well, mean... Well, plant, if you're going to do that, plant native species. Yes. Okay, the reason you want to do natives is they're acclimated to our soils, they don't need fertilizers, they're growing nutrient-poor situations, and so you will not need to fertilize them in order to have them thrive. So by restoring that natural buffer, you're creating a barrier that will take up some of the fertilizer as it moves down towards the prop to mm -hmm. from your property down towards the water. But don't put in things, don't put in exotic species that aren't native to Cape Cod because they're not going to look very good and then you're going to water them and then you're going to put fertilizer on them and you really haven't done very much. So there are places to get native species. Again, not a plug, but my website, we have a list of native species that are native to Cape Cod that are appropriate for these types of situations. Just go pull the list and go buy them. You can buy them at Capabilities Farm, you can buy them at Agway, mm -hmm. and just you know buy native, native species and put that border in as wide as you can make it, as wide as you can tolerate and afford, between the edge of your shoreline and your lawn. That will help. But there's no, you can't dump anything in the pond, unfortunately, no. to stop it. No. We're in this cycle. Right, but what I, I do recall, and uh, town manager and the assistant town manager came with me on a trip to the base for a denitrification system tour. And what they did use, and it's now part of their system, and it removes nitrogen very effectively, believe it or not, is bark mulch. Bark mulch removes the nitrogen. And they, they're part of their denitrification system, which is almost as effective as the wastewater treatment plant. So now, if I'm thinking in my neighborhood, I know this for a fact, we have the storm drains that catch the water and then discharges it into a wetland. If you could at least rub it, let the wash the, through the, a the, the, denit a the, the bag of the, the, the wood, wood, chip, chips. wood chips work to denitrify in anoxic environments, oxygen-free environments. Surficially on the top of the soil, they don't provide that function. No, but you can put them in the, in the soil, in a bag. It has to be deep enough. It has to be deep enough to, to not have oxygen in it. And the top layers of your, I mean, the reason you get plants to grow in the top layers of soil is the soils are oxygenated. Yeah. So you got to get deep. You got to get deep down below, you know, in that four feet below layer um, to get to an anoxic situation before wood chips can provide that denite capability. It's a lot faster than waiting for a, new, a wastewater treatment plant. Well, That's all. I agree. I just, you know. Madam Chair, if you will, mm -hmm. um, it, I, I just, I, I think there's a lot of things we, do. I think I'd like to take a bunch of bite of the apple, uh, bite of the apples today, right now. Um, so, uh, Ashley, you mentioned about like grass going right, you know, can those houses be sited? Is that legal? I, I, I thought that was against the... Do they own right to the pond or is there a... No, but I... But it still has to be some type of vegetation or, and if there isn't, so my, so I have a, multiple questions about that. Mm -hmm. So one, can we cite them? If not, why not? Um, can we, you know, do something of, of acknowledgement and give them a solution or options that they can do um, that will help, help the waters? Because I'm sure they don't want to see the waters in this situation, right? Um, there's also, you know, back on, um, I'd like to see us send out a letter, and I don't know if it's strongly, strongly, you know, the Board of Selectmen strongly encourages, um, you know, any use of, you know, discourage any use of fertilizer. I, I'm, I'm game. Let's do it. It, it, I don't know what the parameters are or surrounding, but. I think everybody. So mm -hmm. we should do that. Um, the other question I have is. Um, I still question, I kind of goes back along the lines of what David was talking about, and I still in my gut believe that there's a lot of old septics in this town, and a lot of these old septic systems are abutting, and I, I, I know I'm close to Santua Pond, so you know what, is there a way for us to do some uh, wells testing? You know, wherever you, you guys would suggest is you guys are much smarter than I am on the topic, and do some wells testing surrounding these waterways to say, okay, why is this well, this testing coming up extraordinarily high compared to mm -hmm. all these other tests? 
Well, maybe there's some leakage going on with, you and know, with a septic John, system. John, you could probably work with the Board of Health because they would know. That's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, the we, we, have, we, we have data on Santuit, Johns, and Ashumet that has already characterized the, night, the nutrient loading into those systems. Mm -hmm. So we actually, yeah, we know, where the, we know where it's coming from. We know what the relative contribution for those three bodies of water are between septic, nitrogen, uh, road runoff, and fertilizer use. We know that, okay? We don't know that from Ashby Wakeby. There's been no study. One of the things I believe, I don't want to steal your thunder, but Natural Resources is going to be submitting an article for fall town meeting consideration to do the study, to fund the study necessary, figure out where all the nutrients are coming from in Mashpee Wakeby, how much of it's external, how much of it's internal recycling, and what the solutions are to you know, permanently fix and solve the problem. That study needs to happen so that we can devise a long-term fix, whether it relies on alternative Title V systems mm -hmm. or bringing sewers up uh, to surround the pond and how far off the pond you need to go. All those questions need to get answered and that town meeting article is intended to do that. All right, so you mentioned that I, I have, I mean, not that I'm in this, you know, category of business and the whole thing, but again, I have never seen, and, you know, as part of that Save Santuit Pond and the whole thing, I've never seen testing that was done and the results around Santuit Pond. And I'm, I'm just talking about Santuit Pond, but that being said, what about, um, to David's point about um, pumping, do... Do they, if, so, if a septic is pumped, isn't it reported to the Board of Health? Yes. yes. It is. Mm -hmm. So uh, if that's the case, how come do we, have we not looked to say, okay. When's the last time you pumped? When's the last time you pumped? And if this address doesn't show up on that report in the past 10, 15 years, we know well, guess wrong. what? There's yeah, a problem. Wrong. Exactly. Uh, and I don't, I mean, if we have the reporting, I, it, it's like reverse engineered, and there's going to be an answer. I, so I think, so and again, I, I think there's like a, there's probably 15 little things. That you can do. That I think we should do tonight. I mean, so one, I'd like to suggest that we look at the, the Board of Health and look at their research as far as who's reporting, you know, their septic's being pumped. Um, and again, I don't, I, I have a sneaky suspicion that, all things being pumped are not maybe reported? I don't know. Um, uh, I'd, I'd be curious to see, and if you don't mind, guys, I'll just, I want to get a whole bunch and then <laughs> I'm going to lose Once my train of thought. <laughs> um, and again, the wells testing um, or samples that mm -hmm. were taken around any bodies of water, I would love to, even though I may not know, I may need explanation of what it says, what it means, um, but I know if something's in red, that's bad, and if it's, if, if it's all red over here, I know there's a problem over here. Um, and, you know, so, but again, the letter, I, I, I'd like to exercise, like, the, we just, we bring it all out and let's, let's clean, the, let's make a little effort to clean the so, water. So you want the Board of Health uh, the, to notify people that have not seen a, a pumping of, of their wastewater uh, they're pulled, they're tanks. They haven't pumped their septic. It hasn't been pumped in 15 years or 10 years or five years, whatever it might be. That's a problem. Send a notice out your septic, your hey, system. Yeah, and, do, and I'm talking, never mind send a notice. I'm not, I want someone knocking on their door because that's a concern. Yes, and is. if, again, and another thing, you know, I think it's signage question. and exposure, I'm seriously concerned that people aren't aware. And if we're talking about this could be life or death for, you know, pets, Children, you're talking about potential paralysis, temporary, whatever. That's very serious, mm -hmm. and I, I agree. I caution, and if it means you, you want to you swim at your own risk, that's you know some people will probably do that anyways. But you know we we run for election every year, right? And you see all these election signs all over, and everybody knows who's running, right? You drive around, so why not have a bunch of election signs made up that says this waterway, so all the roads up and surrounding these waterways, we drop those political signs that says... You're going to get a sign permit. 
Yeah. Well, guess what? We'll prove it right here today. Make a sandwich. And then we stick those signs all around our waterways. And I don't care if it becomes a biohazard and it looks scary. No, I, I think John has a good I, idea. I, I want think, people to be alarmed. And I like, think we should yeah. do that also. Yeah, and yeah. again, so. A mailer. A mailer. Uh, uh, and, uh, sorry. Sorry. If you want to go, if not, I know I was chewing Rodney off here. Send it out. Send the mail I just out. wanted to add, I mean, if we have known locations for these signs, you can use QR codes that are updated. So they wouldn't just be closed. You could check the status of the pond. But we've got people in the audience who said they want to volunteer and do something. We can have a sign made, and they can put it on their front lawn to warn other people. I just think area. it would be beneficial for a QR code mm -hmm. so we wouldn't have to create multiple signs. You know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah. So we, some people could be like, here's the status of the pond, check the status check via the there. town I, website. I agree, but I just... Some I, people... I, some, there's there's yeah. so many people that don't even know what a QR code is. Yeah. And, and, and it, I know when to COVID, most people do if they went to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I get that. But again, I'm talking about along the major roads going to... Uh, uh, I agree. A, a body of water, you put a sign up there. Water could be, you know, whatever it is. And it, and it could be more of a generic that those signs can be moved to different waterways according to whatever the level of the condition it's, on, it's in. And if, when it subsides, subsides as far as the safety level, we pick up the yard signs, we bring them back to town hall, and we use them again. Hopefully we never have to use them again. And we can use the mouse, the DPH posting, and we can blow it up and we can put it on stakes, yes. Yeah, whatever. I, again, I... Yep. I do like the idea of the QR code, though, if it was put on a flyer or a mailer that could go out to the people that at least live on the pond so that they could check the QR code to see, what you know, any are. given day what, mm -hmm. what the levels yep. were for the last test. That's I, another thing I we do. do like Just that idea. That's similar on. to what... The, so the, there was a comment earlier on the county testing... Mm -hmm. And they're going to say it's safe, but they're not testing for blue-green algae. They're only testing for fecal coliform. Right. So there is some confusion between the different agencies, too, because they're not communicating correct. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, so, um, so if there's a water no quality is comment. acceptable no. tested on this date, that's for fecal coliform right. only. No. Rodney. No, I, oh, sorry. Rodney's going to speak. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, you didn't mention solar bees. Because uh -huh. I'm, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. There's a good reason for it. No, I'm, I'm only kidding. You they don't keep work. Your sense of humor. So, um, MTV has uh, texted while we've been sitting here. Uh, they're able to certainly uh, help us get the word out. But I think it's important to come up with a comprehensive plan. Yes. I understand you want instant gratification and I understand there's a lot of frustration and a lot of concern and I get it. However, I think we need to have a staff meeting with DNR, with conservation and a few other folks and we need to take a look at the existing bylaws. Obviously we have a fertilizing uh, bylaw mm -hmm. uh, in effect. Uh, is it uh, far enough? Does it go far enough? No. Uh, does it need to be amended? Does it need to mm -hmm. be revised? Um, are there other bylaws that need to be addressed uh, this October? Um, and then, obviously, uh, somebody mentioned robocalls. Uh, we could certainly uh, get into that. We can do a mass mailing. We, the town can afford a mass mailing. We can do it in your taxes. To all of the folks that live around uh, any pond that is impacted. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the, the uh, quick answers, the, uh, the instant gratification. But I think we need to come up with a uh, comprehensive plan, okay. and I think uh, the board has established one of the uh, goals for this upcoming year. That's yeah. good. I also think we need to um, give some guidance and direction to our sewer commission. You know, the plan that we have was predicated solely on restoration of the water quality of the estuaries. Uh, to the extent that it looks at the ponds or includes ponds at all, it's as simply as a byproduct of what you need to do to prove the estuaries. It doesn't. It was never intended to. They weren't charged with. I'm not claiming them for it. The reality is they weren't charged with coming up with a plan to protect and restore the freshwater water quality. And we need to give a statement from this board that we want them to fix that okay. deficiency in our overall plan and come up with, in concert with our partners in Sandwich, because, oh, by the way, significant portion 
some portion of the load that goes into the pond comes from sandwich. Um, yeah. Um, some portion of the really expensive part comes from sandwich, Dave. Um, <laughs> the, um, some portion of the load that goes into Santuic <clears throat> comes from Barnstable and Sandwich. So we need to broaden the conversation with our adjoining communities and we need to state this as a priority because the amount, you know, and I will say again, I work on this issue in all 15 towns. No town has anybody better positioned to be able to deal with this than we do with Ashley. There is no one like her in any other town now, especially the Karen Malkus is retired in Barnesville, with whom to have this conversation, who could get up and give this presentation. She can't fix it, but we're in a, she can tell us what we need to do and we can amplify upon that when need be. So I think, you know, I like to make a motion that we do a bunch of different things. Maybe picking up on you, make sure I cover everything you want. That we authorize town managers to send a letter to every property owner in Mashpee drawing the connection between water quality declines, fresh and marine, and fertilizer use, and encourage everybody as a short-term measure to eliminate their own fertilizer use on their properties. Number every, two. Every resident? Every resident. Every resident. Strongly okay. discourage. Every yes. resident. Okay. Yeah. Um, number two, that we develop a communication plan that addresses email, web, street signs, you know, 21st century technology, 19th century communications yeah. technology and everything in between um, that we set up you know the ability for people to sign up for notices um, that we direct the sewer commission to develop a plan for remediation of the freshwater systems um, that we um, enter into formal conversations with Barnesville and Sandwich about the ponds coordinate our activities at the staff level figure out our messaging so it's consistent. Um, is that it? I would also like to have okay. Ashley come back into our next meeting and give us an update of what has happened. Yes, I can certainly do that. And if Older I could. Health, uh, yeah. Right. yeah, I don't so, know if that has to be motion, but we can. Well, I think we ought to direct that the, health a, the health agent, because that's under his yes. control. Right, exactly. to that can provide, be a separate. Provide an assessment of where there are cesspools in this town and sort out who's been pumped and who hasn't. I mean, um, and the requirements the key is of pipe. Pump. How about that? Huh? Oh, right. Requirements for pipe. Pump. Well, we don't have that rule yet. No, it's just we have to. We're going to find out. Like, up if someone hasn't, then, and they're surrounded upon. So. And I think that you know, as a matter of enforcement, I think there's a separate enforcement conversation to be had across all range. I know we like to be, you know, friendly to our residents, friendly to the businesses, but we've seen what lax enforcement, we've, you've talked to me about it. I had someone talk to me about it at uh, Papadessa uh, Beach Association annual meeting today, or uh, Saturday, you know, so-and-so got to sell their house and they didn't have to upgrade the cesspool. So I've heard about it twice now in the last month. Um, we need to be stringent on that stuff. And if you need to replace it in order to transfer, benefit of the doubt goes to the environment, not to you. Um, same thing on on enforcing our rules around conservation and maintaining buffers. So, you know, we had, we've I, had. I, would, I have a second on, because I want to stop you before you, because yeah. I, I know there's more. A second but on I, Andrew's motion. I second on your, okay. all of that. Which, in, <laughs> which included the Board of Health, right? Yes. Okay. Health agent. Okay, a roll yeah. call. Tom? Yes. David? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yes. yes. It's a start, and we're going to have to really be Correct. Yeah. Um, so now would the assessor's office have uh, 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 inventory of um, that's where we what, go. What septic we go. systems have been updated? Board of Health does. Board of Board of well, Health. Uh, yes, the Board of Health uh, has the info that uh, you're referencing, but uh, we go to the assessors for our mass mailings. Mass mailings. Oh, for mailings. For mailings. But the Board of Health is going to have a nightmare with this because all these records are on cards. Yeah. Cards. They have the Not computer cards. Right. Cards. I know. I've seen them. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a major undertaking. But you know what? It's time to get into the 21st century yeah, and be able to time. know what the hell's going on it's, in our community. Right. This is okay. happening across the country. This, I just yeah. got back last month. I was in Colorado. Same thing. McIntosh Lake, right up the street from my son's house. Longmont, Colorado. Signs all over the place. Do not swim. And it's, it, it, it's the uh, blue-green algae. That's what it is. It's, it's everywhere. 
So and, and this to speak, is the Ford Hills of the of the White Mountain. There's the, there was a closure in Zion National uh, Park this week. The, okay, there's a closure. There's an increasing level in, in um, Wellfleet in uh, inside the National Seashore and Gull Pond. Yes. It was closed two years ago. So there's a lot of this going on. In terms of the messaging to the public, just a couple of things, and actually fill in where you, these are highly dynamic systems that change. It depends which way the wind's blowing. It depends what the temperature's like. It depends what species it is. So you don't know. We're providing information. On public facilities like Adequan Park, we can keep people out of the water because it's a town beach. You live on the pond, you put a, pond, a boat in the water, you are making an informed decision, maybe, but you're making your own decision about whether you want to expose yourself to the potential risk or not. That we have not put out, and don't really necessarily have the authority to put out, a, you know, you're prohibited from swimming in this body of water. We will try and provide as much information about what we know when we know it, but you need to use your own judgment. Um, the state guidance is when in doubt, stay out, and you need two weeks of below standard, no scum, visible scum, or no toxicity, or no cell count below 70, above 70,000 in order for a restriction to be public health advisory to be lifted. So, and I've seen this in numerous ponds across the Cape. Day one, cell counts 80,000. Looks like hell. Um, put up the health advisory. Next day, rains, it's cold, whatever. Cell system, it dies off, water looks pretty good. That advisory stays in effect for two weeks under the state guidelines because of all the variable nature we've just talked about. Maybe it was fine that next day. Maybe it wasn't. You should be advised that when the cells die and the water clears, when they die, they release their toxins into the water. The highest toxicity can be the day after the bloom abates, oh, when the water looks good. That's scary. So we don't have the resources. She doesn't have the resources. The technology doesn't exist to characterize what's happening on the pond in multiple locations on a daily basis. You need to take what you've heard tonight, go home, think about it, decide what you're willing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed out. I chased my dog out. She got in a couple <clears throat> times. She looked okay this afternoon. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've got seven people coming, including three kids under 12. They're coming for one reason, one reason only this weekend, to be in the water. So I get it. And we're going to have a conversation with their parents, and they're going to decide what they want to do. Um, so we can't give you the certainty you want. We can't give you the certainty you deserve. It doesn't exist. Um, we could tell you one thing, the wind could change tomorrow, and it would be a completely different story. It's frustrating as hell. It's the best we can do. It Thank is you. extremely frustrating. I just want to add that. I've been hounding scientists who are still new to this type of cyanotoxins and the known toxins that are out there, it turns out there's a whole slew of them that are fall under one of those categories. And to try to get positive results is, is time consuming, to what say you, the least. What, what you're gonna get is presence or absence, and then you're gonna get asked, well, what is it, you're gonna get asked to Ashley or our Board of Health aides, what does it mean? And they're gonna give you their best educated understanding of what it means with no regulatory standard, no guidance from the state, and you're going to get our best judgment about what that means. And we can't do any better because the science doesn't exist. It just doesn't. So okay. it, the best we can do, early stage prevention so it doesn't happen again, it, triggered by lawn fertilizer, and we need to accelerate our wastewater control program, and that's what we can do, and that's what we need to do. Thank you, Ashley. So, so on, the, on the flyer and on the mailing, would it be advisable to, you know, solicit public uh, awareness and uh, ask them to, you know, if they identify uh, pockets or blooms, plumes, yeah. uh, to, to call. call a specific Absolutely. number and, um, or even fish kills. You know, if you start mm -hmm. seeing fish kills in a particular area, then that, Is to call. that, that would be a sure sign that I think those kind of considerations should be 
um, communicated on the flyer, flyer and mailing. I think it's a great idea. I, you know, I think call, it also, by adding that, I think it's going to add that serious, like, serious. wow. Everyone yeah. be vigilant. This you is talk serious. about yeah. fish, fish kills and, right. and people take notice. Hey, people will start to, like, whoa, this, this is serious. That's right. You know, and I, I, that's a great point, Dave. Yeah. The other, the other uh, on your, on your first initial slide, um, it said that trace metals were, uh, contribute to the cyanobacteria. Um, <laughs> I don't know where copper falls in that mix, you know, but, uh, you know, with, with regards to the gun range, I mean, you know, if, if we're already having these problems and stuff, you know, there's, there's elements that could contribute to this that don't even come from the actual abutters. It, it may travel, you know, the water travels in that southeasterly direction and could contribute to this. So, I mean, we, we have too much going on. There's too many issues. Um, so this is just another one uh, on a deterrent for the, that whole gun range thing for me. And that's why we're gonna stress the diagnostic study. So we'll get that information from a consultant who has worked on numerous ponds and they can tell us exactly what's going on, where the nutrients are coming from, what's in the pond, invasive species. It will be all encompassing and it will be uh, given to the town to further our management efforts on clean water. Thank you for that, and thank you for your work on this. Do you have anything else for me? Uh, anybody else, I, anything for Ashley? You know, back on, I know I mentioned the, the, the well testing and the whole thing. Yes. If you have any, I, I don't know when that supposed testing was done um, around Santua Bond, but wherever, whenever that was done, it had to be before my time as selectman, because I that's so that would put it six seven years ago. Yeah, there was the ACOM diagnostic study. Mm -hmm. They addressed stormwater inputs and non-point source areas of pollution. Okay, and I, and again, some of that you know may come out with the finding out about the border health and the septic pumping pumping and things like that. But if there is any of those reports, I'd be I'd love to see mm -hmm. those reports, just even if they are. You know, well, that's that's in uh, Glenn's realm. I'm not positive on record of pumping, to be honest. Right. I that could come up into your, your yeah. part of your meeting. I think a lot of them are on the website. I'm, I'm, they're, on, they're accessible on the website, I think, some of the reports. <coughs> I took issue with the ACOM report, though, because I, I think some of the results, uh, it, it made it sound more natural occurrence um, than anything else. And, and, you know, from my understanding, it was done on the back end of a drop. So the, the transmission of the nitrogen loads and such, you know, it, it's transmitted by water. So if you're doing it on the back end of the drought, I don't know that the information is as accurate. And, and it seemed as though the, the firm um, kind of set the standard on how to test for those types of things. They I think they use some dated things. assumptions about the mobility of phosphorus and, you know, overemphasized how much of what's happening in Santuit is recycling a phosphorus from the bottom versus how much right. is coming in yeah. from the external load from the watershed. And even though I take issue with some of Ashley's predecessors characterizations of um, the success of the solar bees, the reality is that we're all, even he agreed that these large four, five, six inch rain events that have now become commonplace are flushing more nitrogen out or phosphorus out of the surrounding watershed into the pond. So, you know, no matter what you do, you got to stop adding more to the system, even if it's being driven by internal loads. Because what's the point of fixing the problem in the pond if all you're going to do is add more back in? Right. It's like, you know, so you just, without our, you know, it almost doesn't matter from the perspective of what you do to argue to decrease the inputs from the outside the pond into the ponds. No matter what strategy you pick, you're always going to want to minimize the external load. The anthropogenic yes. equal, um, yeah. variable is within our control. Totally. The natural occurrence, not so much. Right, right? and then we're managing a natural Catalyst. system, but can we, if we need to stop insulting the system by adding more of what we know the problem to be. I think that report said it was the natural occurrence was 75%. They're saying so, natural I, recycling I, from within the pond. I did not agree with that. So it's not natural recycling. I just wanted to clarify. That's hundreds of years of land use accumulated at the bottom from excess algae blooms. So it's not, 
it's something that has over time accumulated on the bottom of the pond. And that's also from anthropogenic land use. Okay, we voted. We did, didn't we? You did. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Good job. Okay, discussion and approval of seasonal no parking designation on the entry road to the state boat ramp for Mashby Wakeby <laughs> Pond, Fisherman <laughs> Landing, and off of Route 130. I'll be brief. Uh, we check with the state. They're okay with this as long as the board approves it, and uh, we're recommending it. Do you uh, want to I make a motion we designate. Seasonal no parking along the entryway to the state boat ramp. The lease we have with the state limits parking to the lined yes. spaces within within the parking area anyway. So this is just redundant reaffirmation of that. Second. Yep. Roll call. Yes. David. Yes. 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 Good. On a related matter, can we have a discussion at the next meeting about a similar uh, Parking restriction across from Mockway Bay boat ramp. I've gotten a lot of complaints from oh, folks yeah. of people park who don't have stickers parking on the street on, on Great Neck South Great Neck across South. the street from the boat oh, ramp. So lot. could we yeah. post that? Uh, we can with your authority. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we'll put so that if, could you put that on for next, for next time? Meeting. So we get yeah. public notice on sure. that? Sure. Yes. It'll have to be public notice. Yeah. Okay. Discussion and approval acceptance of unit deed for 31 Mercantile Way, unit six and seven, Mashby Mass. Is this our deed for? Yes. Um, and I definitely need your approval tonight because closing is tomorrow. Oh, great. <laughs> I make a motion. I make a motion. We accept the deed yes. for uh, yeah. six, 31 Mercantile Way, Wait, unit six, six and, and seven. seven. Roll call, John? Yes. 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 Yes, that's great. I need your signatures tonight. Okay. okay. All right. Please. <laughs> All right. Seems Any... like it took forever. <laughs> <laughs> Any liaison reports? None at this None? time. None at uh, this time? All I'll say is that um, I was able to sit and meet with our new town engineer. I'm extremely impressed with his technical capabilities. I think he brings a ton oh, to the table as an advocate for... Um, cost-effective design of the sewer system, and he's going to provide ideas and recommendations that will guide our design engineers that are going to save his salary dozens of times over. Great. Um, Great. And that they we're very you know, lucky to have, have him, have. and I encourage the Sewer Commission to utilize him to his fullest capabilities. Great. Great. I do have one thing with the um, Mashpee Chamber. We have a new citizen of the year who is John Miller, who's in the audience tonight. Congratulations. And um, town manager updates. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, <laughs> obviously, the transfer station is closed Sunday, July 4th. Uh, we've got an online auction going on through uh, July 12th. Uh, you know all about Mashpee Wakeby Pond and the uh, swimming advisory and the fireworks display as of right now is July 1st to Mashby High School with a rain date of July 2nd. It's also going to uh, rain. It's but also uh, rain. right now, uh, and obviously I'm not a weather person, uh, it's not looking good. No. What's plan C? Uh, beyond uh, July 2nd, there is no plan There's C no at this rain particular day. time. Yeah. We usually don't. Okay. Unfortunately. Anything else? Can we adjourn? Second. Second. Roll call? Yes. 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 Thank you, everyone. We need signatures. Yes. Signatures.